Uh, that's 1.1 billion below the enacted level, but it's also 8.6 billion above the budget request. We have obviously targeted funding in this bill to essential, essential investments in safety, infrastructure, and housing assistance for our most vulnerable populations. This includes the elderly, the disabled, and our veterans. This bill also includes $17.8 billion in discretionary appropriations and $76.7 billion in total resources for the Department of Transportation. Mr. Chairman, the Federal Aviation Administration is funded at $16.6 billion, an increase of $435 million above the budget request. We provided this increase to keep advancing next-gen, next-gen programs with over a billion dollars and to advance the safe operation of our air traffic control system. We made sure that we provided funding to support the men and women who work every day, every day to ensure that we maintain U.S. leadership as the safest, most complex air traffic system in the entire planet. This has been a top priority of the subcommittee for a number of years, and it clearly it has been a top priority of mine. Through the federal aid uh, highways program, the bill delivers $45 billion in road and, and bridge funding from the Highway Trust Fund, which is almost a billion above the fiscal year 2017 le level. This funding, members, will provide much needed growth and improvements within America's highway system. The bill provides $2.2 billion to the Federal Railroad Administration to continue this committee, our committee's uh, commitment to rail safety and to make critical infrastructure investments. The bill also addresses the repair backlog on the Northeast Corridor with a $500 million investment in the Federal-State Partnership to the State of Good Repair Grants. Now, we didn't agree with the administration's proposal to shut down the Transit Capital Investment Grant Program. And instead, we provided funding to keep projects moving through the pipeline. As for housing programs, we work to ensure that we continue assistance to, again, as I said before, our most vulnerable populations. This bill includes $38.3 billion for the Department of Housing and Urban Development. The bill includes significant increases to keep pace with inflation. Big number, by the way, almost $1 billion above last year for a direct rental assistance to maintain housing for those who are currently being served. And, of course, the bill places a priority on homelessness assistance programs and housing for uh, opportunities for persons with AIDS, funding these programs at the enacted level and significantly, significantly above the budget request. This bill restores a number of community development uh, programs that were proposed for elimination in the budget request. So what are those? Those are CDBG, home, capacity building. Now let me tell you, we listened to the members of this committee and of the entire House from both sides of the aisle, and we made sure that we, uh, we, knew, uh, we knew that was a huge priority for all of you. These programs support decision-making where it frankly should happen, which is at the local level. Finally, um, Mr. Chairman, and we've heard of the other subcommittees, but I'd like to, we need to thank the hardworking, talented staff who have helped all of us in putting this bill together. Now, the subcommittee is, is staff is led by our clerk and staff director, uh, Doug uh, District. Now, I'll tell you about Doug. I would call him in the weirdest times from my car and throw things out there. I, thank God, he, I don't think you forgot to, to put anything that I, that I asked you in this bill because uh, sometimes my memory fails me, but his doesn't seem to fail him. Uh, also, the rest of the subcommittee, uh, Cheryl Tucker, Carl Barrick. By the way, Carl had surgery. I probably shouldn't say this. He had surgery, and he was had all sorts. You know, he was kind of in pain, and he was still working, and he had swelling, but he was still there in the office working. While uh, after that surgery, Jenny Hulra, Matt Anderson, and Amber uh, McRae, and uh, who have been phenomenal. My personal staff, Cesar Gonzalez, my chief of staff, and Miguel Mendoza, the chief, uh, the uh, right hand person, uh, have been phenomenal. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank the minority staff, uh, Joe Carlisle and Angel Ohm and uh, uh, Sean Maxwell uh, in Mr. Price's personal, uh, personal office as well, Mr. Chairman. Look, we've made some tough choices, but place a priority. This bill places a priority on safety, on infrastructure, and an assistance to the most vulnerable among us. With that, Mr. Chairman, I hope that uh, this committee will report this bill favorably to the House, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Diaz Ballard. Mr. Price, you're recognized for any comments you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to begin, as um, 
as I did in subcommittee last week by thanking our chairman, uh, Mario diaz Villart for a uh, cooperative and collaborative uh, process. Uh, he's continued to accommodate uh, both uh, Republican and Democratic members whenever possible. I've enjoyed working with him, anticipate working uh, with him and getting this bill uh, in better shape as we go uh, on the, down, down the line to, uh, to final approval. I also want to echo his uh, thanks to the staff, who, uh, with, without whom none of this would have been possible. This year's bill includes $56.5 billion for critical transportation, housing, and community development programs at DOT, HUD, and related agencies. This represents a $1.1 billion reduction compared to uh, last year's level. As I stated last week, it's just not an adequate uh, allocation. Uh, the chairman has been dealt a very uh, difficult hand. Uh, the bill is a reflection, unfortunately, of the budget straitjacket in which the majority has uh, placed us, causing self-inflicted damage both to the appropriations process and to the country. The great irony is that despite all this chest thumping, the majority's approach fails to address the real drivers of the deficit. Republican budgets, at least when they're able to pass them out of their committee, have focused deficit reduction efforts almost entirely on domestic discretionary appropriations. That gives us truly the worst of both worlds. We don't really deal effectively with the deficit, and yet we do untold damage to critical national investments. I'm afraid the bill before us tonight is a prime example. The Tiger program is completely eliminated despite the high demand for its competitive grant funding. Capital investment grants, more commonly referred to as new starts in transit, is cut by almost 25%, or $659 million below last year's level. While the bill includes language to ensure that FTA continues to rate and review projects in the grant pipeline, this lower funding level threaten the, threatens the progress and the viability of major transit projects all over the country. Meanwhile, housing and community development programs fare a little better. Community Development Block Grants and the HOME Program, both lauded by local elected officials around the country for their flexibility, for their effectiveness. They're each cut by $100 million. I'm also concerned that the bill fails to provide adequate funding to extend the life of the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. Because it's an independent third party, the council could look across various agencies of government and find ways to improve the delivery of housing services for those experiencing homelessness. Local service providers across the country report that the council is an invaluable resource that bolsters their work. On the brighter side, this bill provides adequate, if not expansive, funding for most of HUD's core housing programs. It sustains basic safety activities at DOT, and it offers modest funding increases for critical accounts at the Federal Aviation Administration to accelerate next-gen development and implementation. Increased funding for next-gen activities reflects the strong bipartisan consensus within the Appropriations Committee that we must continue providing the resources necessary to strengthen and modernize the air traffic control system. This consensus is sorely lacking on the authorizing committee. Republicans chose to advance a partisan and controversial plan that, if implemented, would jeopardize next-gen's progress and would hand over federal assets and control of the skies to private industry. The mark also includes a significant $475 million increase for the Federal Railroad Administration's Federal State Partnership for State of Good Repair Program, which will jumpstart infrastructure improvement projects within the national rail system. Also, I want to thank the chairman for including $20 million for the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative. Funding this program nominally in the base will give us a chance to improve this number as the process moves forward. The bright spots in the bill, however, cannot paper over its fundamental 
flaw, the 302B allocation. While one could rearrange the funding levels in the bill to address one or several of the key areas I've mentioned, there's no way to sufficiently address all of these gaps throughout the bill. We're in the midst of a housing crisis in this country. I don't think that's too strong a word. Millions of Americans struggle to pay rent as wages fail to rise as quickly as housing costs. Our infrastructure continues to deteriorate at an alarming rate, causing congestion on our roads, delays at our airports, and bottlenecks at our ports. Deferring these necessary investments will only cost us more in future years. The bill before us fails to provide the bold investments necessary to modernize and upgrade our nation's transportation and housing infrastructure. In fact, we cannot write credible appropriations bills that have any chance of becoming law until we have a new bipartisan budget agreement. The majority's apparent plan to quickly move this bill and others to the House floor next week doesn't alter that basic fact. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I must register my strong objection to several controversial policy writers that unnecessarily attack high-speed rail, roll back transportation safety for the traveling public, and harm labor rights. I plan to offer an amendment to strip these writers, which have no place in this bill. In its current form, this bill before us represents a step in the wrong direction. However, I do remain hopeful hopeful that a new bipartisan budget deal will be reached that makes it possible to eventually revise this legislation to garner bipartisan support. I look forward to working with the chairman toward this end in the months ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Price, and thank you, Mr. Diaz-Ballard, for your comments. The bill that you and your subcommittee have put together and crafted as a sound bill that will help improve our transportation infrastructure and ensure that housing is available for those in need. The United States has the largest economy in the world. We must have safe, reliable, and efficient inf infrastructure to support and sustain us. Keeping America open for business and pleasure requires our roads, rails, ports, and airports, so this bill affects everyone. That's why this bill includes $76.7 billion in total budgetary resources to repair and modernize our transportation systems. This includes funding for the Federal Aid Highway Program, which will provide much needed growth and improvements to America's highways and bridge infrastructure. For the FAA, the legislation includes $16.6 billion. This total provides full funding for air traffic control personnel, keeping U.S. airspace safe for all travelers. The bill also fully funds NextGen, as has been mentioned, building on several years of investment to modernize and enhance our airspace and ease air congestion. Other tr Department of Transportation funding ensures that our communities can build and maintain their mass transit systems and that, incre that increase in the productivity and increase the productivity of our ports. Safety is also a priority in this bill with responsible increases provided for various transportation safety programs, especially rail safety. Within the Department of Housing and Urban Development, funding is maintained to serve our most vulnerable citizens, the elderly, those with disabilities, and yes, veterans, and to encourage home ownership and the pursuit of the American dream. The bill also supports community planning and development programs, including the Community Development Block, block, grant, block Grants, that will encourage economic development and improve the quality of life for Americans across the nation. In closing, I want to thank Chairman Diaz-Ballard, Ranking Member Price, and all the members of the subcommittee for their hard work, and especially, again, the staff that put this bill together on a rather accelerated uh, uh, manner and done, uh, did an excellent job of incorporating a lot of uh, the interests and priorities that members of this committee had, as well as our entire House of Representatives. So it's uh, my pleasure to support the bill and to recognize Ms. Lowy, the ranking member, for any comments she may wish to give. Thank you, Chairman Freelinghuisen. Thank you, Chairman Diaz-Balad and ranking member Price. I certainly commend you on your effort, but this bill seriously falls short of funding the vast infrastructure needs facing our country today. 
I commend you on your effort, but it's just not doing what has to be done. It is the first of many bills we'll consider this week that are prime examples of the false choice this committee faces as a result of the irresponsible Republican leadership's failure to work with Democrats on a workable spending agreement. The Republican appropriations bills break the Budget Control Act caps for defense spending by nearly $73 billion, while decimating non-defense priorities that give hardworking Americans a more fair shake by creating jobs, rebuilding infrastructure, training, and educating people for the 21st century workforce and improving America's health. In each of our districts, we have damaged roads, structurally deficient bridges, aging transportation systems that demand robust investments in infrastructure and community development that put people to work and improve safety and the economy. In fact, the American Society of Civil Engineers' most recent report gave U.S. infrastructure a paltry D-plus grade and identified a $2 trillion investment gap. $2 trillion. Then-candidate Donald Trump made infrastructure investment a campaign promise to the American people. Now President Trump and his Republican Congress put forth an infrastructure bill that cuts jobs and would put us even further behind in modernizing American transport. The bill before us eliminates Tiger grants. It drastically cuts investment grants when there is a crisis on the rails for commuters and train travelers in the New York metro area. If we continue to neglect infrastructure that is crumbling before our very eyes, it will only get more expensive to address, not to mention more dangerous for all Americans. The bill also falls short when it comes to ensuring a roof over the heads of the most vulnerable Americans, protections from toxic toxins in homes, and suitable communities and living conditions, cuts to community development block grants, home investment partnerships, the public housing capital fund, and even lead hazard control threaten the health and safety of struggling families who need assistance to get back on their feet. It's tough to get a job raise a family, and be a productive member of your community if you don't know where you'll rest your head at night. We need investments in affordable housing and resources to address the lack of supply for housing for the homeless. Despite the talk about the majority putting forward a 12-bill spending omnibus in the coming weeks, we all know that Democratic votes will be needed to reach a spending agreement that can be enacted. When Republicans get serious about that, I'll be ready and willing to work with my colleagues to make sure this bill better funds initiatives that Americans rely on to pursue the American dream. Today, Democrats will have amendments to invest in the American people. I know we've had late nights in committee to accommodate the majority's accelerated schedule, but I want all my colleagues to know Democrats will not allow these partisan job coming bills to go quietly in the night without doing our best to improve them as much as we can. So let's prepare for a long week. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Lowy. Uh, before I recognize anyone for uh, some general comments, I note some flowers in front of Catherine Clark. C could it be that this is your birthday? I, I think she deserves. I, th I think she deserves a song. This is your birthday song. It won't last all long. Hey.
<laughs> and, and I'll note, I'm not sure where they are, uh, that I understand that the gentlewoman from Maine may have made a contribution uh, to, uh, to uh, the evening. I won't tell you where and what, but you can imagine what it might be uh, at, at another location. And it's not a lobster roll. Uh, further discussion on the bill? Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, chairman Dan and then Mr. Viskoski. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to thank the uh, chair and ranking member of uh, the subcommittee for their good work on this legislation, particularly given the constraints they're working under. I just want to take a moment to highlight a, a HUD program that I believe has proven extremely valuable the last uh, few years, uh, which is the Housing Counseling Assistance Program. Uh, in my district, I've seen some very positive impact uh, from this initiative. The Housing Counseling Program provides housing counseling uh, services to homeowners and tenants, uh, both pre- and post-purchase, uh, and can help struggling homeowners prevent foreclosure or assist them in avoiding difficulties in the first place. Uh, after the national housing and foreclosure crisis, uh, Congress established the National Foreclosure Mitigation Counseling to provide uh, counseling to struggling homeowners. Uh, many that used uh, housing counseling assistance funding then received the uh, funding from the then FMC. Uh, as the country has recovered from the housing crisis, uh, that program has uh, been phased out. That has left housing counseling uh, providers uh, uh, facing a st steep decline in funding, although there's a strong and demonstrated need for their services. Uh, I know Housing Counseling Assistance Program took a $5 million cut in this year's budget from uh, last year's enacted level. And uh, I hope as we continue to move through this uh, appropriations process, we can find a way to support additional funds to make this program whole so that these uh, services are available to homeowners and potential home buyers. And I, I think it's it's wise uh, for us to invest in these programs to ensure that homeowners and buyers are on solid footing, uh, which will prevent uh, much greater costs down the line from foreclosures for and, and, and other problems. And I appreciate uh, Chairman Diaz-Balart's uh, consideration. We've discussed this issue. Thank you. Yield Thank back. you, Mr. Dent. Mr. Viskoski is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to rise and talk about uh, two aspects of one account in this bill. Uh, and to thank uh, very much uh, the chair, ranking member, the members of the subcommittee, as well as the staff. Uh, in his opening remarks, uh, Mr. Price indicated that the subcommittee was dealt a very difficult hand, and it is evidenced uh, by the Capital Investment Grants Program, uh, vitally important to projects in at least 23 states in this country. Uh, it is relative to new starts for mass transit. Uh, during fiscal year uh, 2017, uh, the committee recommended $2.4 billion worth of spending. Uh, unfortunately, in their nonsensical budget uh, request, uh, the OMB reduced that by 50%. In a perfect world, I wish the subcommittee had maintained funding at current year levels, uh, but the chair and ranking member have been put in a $500 million hole. Uh, I appreciate the fact that they plussed up that account. Uh, what I also uh, want to emphasize is that the administration also suggested uh, for all of these communities in these 23 states that have ongoing projects with spent millions of dollars in preparation that they should no longer be considered actively. On page 58 and 59 of the report, there is very important language. I would just read one sentence. The committee directs FTA to continue to advance eligible projects into project development, engineering, and construction through capital investment. Some might suggest that this is simply report language. I would suggest that if this committee has bought paper, and this committee has bought ink, and this committee has prepared that report, uh, the administration ought to follow the direction of the committee and would simply point out in closing that this does affect programs in Florida, North Carolina, California, Maryland, Michigan, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Texas, Virginia, Washington, Wisconsin, and yes, the state of Indiana. I am deeply grateful to the subcommittee chair and ranking for their work. Thank you, Mr. Viscosti. Further general discussion. Uh, seeing none, I'm pleased to recognize Mr. Diaz Ballard, for, I believe, for a manager's amendment. Is that right? Mr. Chairman, yes. I have a, member, a manager's amendment on the desk, and I would ask uh, for unanimous consent that the amendment be considered. Consider that. Uh, proceed. Um, folks, before you have a standard man uh, manager's amendment, uh, making really non-controversial and requested changes to the bill and report. Now, this has been drafted with the minority, with uh, Mr. Price, uh, and again, we've accommodated as many members. 
as many requests as possible, and I would uh, ask, uh, urge the adoption of this amendment, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Price. Mr. Chairman, I too urge adoption of the amendment. Uh, request, numerous requests from Democratic members have been included, and we uh, appreciate them. Okay. Uh, further discussion? Uh, Ms. Kaptur. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the manager's amendment and offer thanks to uh, Chairman Diaz Ballard and Ranking Member uh, Price for including uh, added support for the St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation uh, in this amendment. Thank you as well to Congressman Joyce uh, for working together in support of, of this agency. However, uh, even with the additional funding, uh, the Seaway Corridor, so vital to our Great Lakes economy, and the fourth seacoast in our nation's defense is taking a 13 percent cut in this bill. Frankly, without activities in this corridor being operational, fully operational, our nation cannot conduct war. Um, however, um, the Seaway system is quite cost effective and it's the workhorse for the entire Great Lakes region, allowing shipping in the Midwest to connect our region with the rest of the global transportation system. As our nation continues to compete with global trading and freight routes, it is imperative that we not penalize any of our coasts. And I look forward to working with the chairman and ranking member to not shortchange the Great Lakes region and this seaway as the process moves forward and urge my colleagues to support the manager's amendment. Thank you, Mr. Kaptur. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Quigley is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to uh, rise in support of the manager's amendment and thank the uh, chairman and, and ranking member uh, for including a small change in the way HUD operates that could make a very big difference in the lives of countless extremely low-income seniors in the manager's amendment. Um, the HUD Section 202 Housing for the Elderly Program serves around 400,000 seniors with an average income of 13,000. Without this housing, it's clear that most of the elderly Americans in the program would have nowhere to go. Uh, this change would allow Section 202 PRAC homes to switch over from this section to Section 8 rental, which are allowed to refinance or otherwise assume debt that are already an accepted and familiar platform for private underwriters. The change proposed in this amendment will help promote public-private partnership, increase access to safe, proven tools to generate private financing, and help HUD-assisted properties ensure their long-term stability and affordability without the need of increased appropriations. Thank you again. Mr. Gregory, further discussion? Uh, hearing none, uh, the question is on the amendment, manager's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, uh, and the amendment is agreed to. Mr. Price is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. Uh, clerk will read. A an amendment offered by Mr. Mr. Red Price. and the gentleman's recognized. Which amendment, sir? Which amendment, amendment? Price, no, amendment number one. number one. The gentleman's recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment uh, for our consideration this evening dealing with infrastructure and dealing with the infrastructure of this country in an ambitious and comprehensive way. Throughout last year's campaign, both presidential candidates talked at length about the need to improve America's infrastructure. We all probably talked about it. Uh, Democrats and Republicans alike have noted the need to improve our nation's aged bridges, crumbling roads, leaking sewers, to modernize our airports. The budget request in May outlined in very broad strokes a plan to spend $200 billion on infrastructure. We were assured that details would be forthcoming. When Secretary Chow appeared before our subcommittee in June, she indicated that a proposal might be forthcoming later this fall. Well, colleagues, America's infrastructure can't keep waiting. For years, we've stood in this committee and quoted from the American Society of Civil Engineers infrastructure report card, which gives our nation's infrastructure a D plus. Yet we've done very little to improve the situation. The president noted this in February, and I'm quoting, we're going to start spending on infrastructure big. It's not like we have a choice. It's not like let's hold off. I agree. He's right. And that brings us to my amendment. The amendment invests $200 billion in Americans' highways, rail, transit, and housing infrastructure. It would allow us to repair aging bridges, repair our roads, 
modernize our airports and our airspace, and provides needed funding to improve our ports, ensure that Americans have access to clean water. It ensures that goods can move effectively, efficiently around the country and that workers who make these goods have a safe, affordable place to call home. It would allow for these funds to be spent over a number of years to ensure that the right projects get funded and that we can maximize the benefits. My amendment also includes disaster funding for roads, transit, and community development so that when a community experiences a natural disaster, funding is available immediately to address critical infrastructure needs. My home state of North Carolina, several other states continue to slowly recover from Hurricane Matthew, other recent disasters. This funding would accelerate the ongoing rebuilding efforts and provide perspective funding for future disasters. We were assured by the President that infrastructure would be a priority, yet a plan for infrastructure keeps getting pushed back, back, back on the back burner. It's clear that the Republican majority in the Congress has other priorities. But if there's one area that should have broad bipartisan support, it's this one. It's an infrastructure package that would tangibly improve the lives of our constituents. Now, some of you may balk at the cost, yet the American Society of Civil Engineers estimates that there's a funding gap of $2 trillion over the next decade. This amendment represents the kind of investment that needs to occur each year to return our country to a state of good repair. While this bill focuses on transportation and housing, there are other areas that could use investments. Dams, levees, waterways are in dire need of resources. It's clear that we're going to need to make big investments to reap the benefits of a well-functioning infrastructure. Others may object to the emergency designation of these funds. But isn't our infrastructure clearly in a state of emergency? We need the investment now, and we know that in defense appropriations, the defense bill has benefited from the use of OCO funding as a way to meet the needs of our overseas military operations. We provided $83 billion for OCO in last year's omnibus alone. As the President said earlier this year, we spend $6 trillion. We spend $6 trillion in the Middle East, and we have potholes all over our highways and roads. I agree. If we can find a way to finance roads and bridges in Iraq and Afghanistan, we ought to be able to finance infrastructure here at home. As it stands, the T-HUD bill is not up to the task of building the infrastructure our country needs and deserves. Adopting my amendment would be a good way to start restoring and repairing the infrastructure that we all depend on. I urge adoption of the amendment. Okay, thank you, Mr. Price. Mr. diaz Ballard, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I uh, cannot support this amendment at uh, this time because, it, again, it would, uh, it would exceed our allocation. So if this amendment were adopted, it would prevent the bill from going uh, to the floor. So I ask the members to uh, join me in opposing uh, this uh, amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Wasserman Schultz is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in strong support of the gentleman from North Carolina's amendment. Uh, just. Just think about what we've heard over the last number of months. We've had a president who has made promise after promise about creating jobs, fixing our roads and bridges, and taking our infrastructure into the 21st century. Yet, like the rest of his bluster, these promises have gone unmet. This president promised an infrastructure plan within 100 days of his inauguration, and we are at day 177 and no plan. This president promised a trillion dollar infrastructure package, saying Democrats were not thinking big enough. Well. <laughs> We're thinking big enough at least not to be able to see any trillion dollar plan because he hasn't proposed one. Moreover, this president has shamefully proposed a budget that slashes the Department of Transportation and our critical infrastructure grant programs. The few reports that we have seen about a so-called infrastructure package seem to be nothing more than another tax write-off for the wealthy and not the genuine federal capital investment that our constituents both deserve and need. With a D-plus rating from the American Society of Civil Engineers, tax breaks for pipelines is not what we need. Our crumbling municipal water systems will not be fixed by tax incentives for private investors. The ranking member's amendment is the legislation that our nation truly needs, and it really is only the tip of the iceberg, or rather the tip of the bridge, or the tip of the road, or the tip of any of the other types of infrastructure that we so desperately need. 
As Democrats, this amendment demonstrates that we are prepared to invest in our airports and seaports, in high-speed rail and updated sewer systems. We're prepared to modernize our public housing buildings and build bridges and tunnels resilient to extreme weather patterns and climate change. Finally, we are prepared to address the economic necessity of this investment and end the long-term neglect of this majority. This Congress too often waits for a crisis or a tragedy to finally make the proper investments. And yet, after seeing <coughs> tragic train derailments and the results of poorly maintained highways, we have still failed to act. This $200 billion package is the start that we need, and it is only a start. With that, I urge a yes vote on the amendment, and I yield back. Mr. Quigley, re <laughs> representing a well-fed table over there, I'm noting, <laughs> especially your colleague on your left. <laughs> <laughs> There's dessert in your future, too. Mr. Quigley. Yeah, I'm still waiting for the Chicago pizza to get here. There's some something out there that's called pizza. Okay. Uh, Mr. Quigley. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I think the best way to describe this is don't think big, don't talk big if you don't get the basics done. And this has a real impact on people's lives. Uh, people get on metro trains in uh, uh, my colleague Mr. Davis's district downtown, and they ride through four or five congressional districts, Democrat and Republican. Um, none of those people th are thinking that they're on a Democratic or Republican train. But uh, there are problems. <clears throat> uh, Pace bus, CTA passenger rail, and metro commuter rail in my district and in the region are in dire need of funding to achieve just a state of good repair. So if you got a big infrastructure package later, you still have to include all this because it's the basics of how people get around. Uh, our friends, our millennials aren't buying cars anymore, right? They're Ubering, they're taking public transportation, they're walking, they're taking, they're riding a bike. So we have to build an infrastructure for, the, for this century, not the last one. It doesn't help when you cut the guts out of it and you undermine it in the manner that's happening here, unfortunately. <laughs> So we have an $86 billion state of good repair backlog for our rail systems alone. Just, just appreciate this. The CTA in Chicago carries more people than Amtrak does. Just the Chicago Transit Authority in a month. So more people ride my light rail in Chicago, than, and I like Amtrak, but more than the whole country rides it in a, in a year. So between the CTA and Metra, there are $13 billion in the repair backlog uh, just to get into a state of good repair. So look, I know everybody in this room would like to get these things done, but I just think, unfortunately, short side of the administration to cut here so dramatically and then say we're dreaming build big. You don't dream big if you're cutting out the basic stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Quigley, Ms. Pingree is recognized, and thanks again for your large yes. <laughs> Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I, I wanted to speak in favor of um, Mr. Price's amendment, but I, I will say that I was very happy to bring down some blueberry pies this week. I think there had been some controversy about... Uh, wait till you taste it. Um, there's some disagreement about which state produces the best blueberries, but I think you'll find, after you tried a piece of pie, that Maine wild blueberries... Um, are by far the tastiest. They're a little bit tinier, a little bit tartar, and have the best flavor, not to mention we make the best pies in Maine. And in case you think this is something I do in my backyard. You got 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Sorry, okay. I got to talk about the amendment. It's a $170 million. I uh, know we, we raised 107 million pounds last year, and it's worth about $250 million in our state. So it's a big industry. But anyway, very quickly, in, um, in support of this amendment, there are so many cuts in here that um, are not going to be good for my state, uh, whether it's the Tiger Grants, which are zeroed out. They've played a really important role in Portland, Maine, which I represent, building a marine terminal. Um, making sure we had more capacity in the terminal and, and making it a shipping hub. Uh, we had funding in there for two badly needed bridges, um, bridge replacements on the Maine-New Hampshire border, also critical to both of our states. Maine's bridges received a C-minus grade, roads a D grade from the American Society of Engineers, and taking away tiger grades is not the right thing to do at this moment in time. Time. Although it didn't cut uh, CDBG grants fully, I'm sorry to see that there's a $100 million 
cut in there, the flexibility of CDBG grants makes them important to communities all over all of our states. Um, some of our grants have been used for community policing efforts, outreach to homeless individuals in experiencing chronic health, and peer coaching for individuals with severe and persistent mental illness, addiction, and homelessness. Uh, they're a very important grant. And also the Home Investment Partnership Program was cut by 100 million. Um, in, in Maine, we use that to build 85 affordable family and elderly housing units, as well as short-term rental assistance for homeless individuals and families. They're all very critical. I agree with the ranking member on his amendment, and I hope my colleagues feel the same way. Thank you, Ms. Angry. Ms. Lee is recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to associate myself with all of the remarks that have been made in support of this amendment. Uh, and just to say a couple of extra things, at a, uh, extra, uh, making a couple of extra points. When we um, need strong infrastructure and investments in our nation's um, infrastructure from public transit and bridges to the electric grid and high-speed rail, this bill uh, before us really uh, provides no path forward. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers, our country's um, infrastructure gets a uh, D-plus rating. It's not surprised that America gets a failing grade because the report estimates that we need more than $2 trillion in the next 10 years to improve our collapsing bridges, roads, and highways. We can't allow our nation's foundation to crumble. We must continue to invest in programs like the National Infrastructure Investment Grants, which are commonly known as Tiger Grants, which this amendment does. These critical grants support innovative projects that help improve access to reliable, safe, affordable transportation for urban and for rural communities alike. In my own district, for example, a $6.3 million Tiger Grant helped the city of Oakland a update its aging infrastructure at a subway, uh, AKA BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit District Station, and accommodate the city's growing population. We could not have done that without this Tiger Grant. We also must ensure that we're fully funding the community development block grants to improve public infrastructure. This funding is critical for families for, like those living, for example, in Flint, Michigan, who still don't have access to clean water. The children of Flint and their families are continuing to face a tragedy, really a situation that could have been avoided had the state and the federal government made the necessary investments in our water infrastructure. So this amendment fixes the bill before us, and in many places that lack adequate investment in America's future, we really need to support this bill. So I urge you to I vote on it. On Thank the you, Ms. Lee. Pleased to recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Ms. DeLauro. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. You, you're, there are a couple chicken wings left, would you? Would you like one? Uh, even from this vantage point, it looked pretty empty to uh, me. <laughs> I also, my, my colleague, Mr. Quigley, I see he's eating his pizza, but don't, don't buy his rhetoric about Chicago deep dish pizza. Uh, pizza. It's about New Haven and, uh, uh, you know, in the heart of the Italian-American community. And uh, is that not right, Mr. Price? Okay, you know that. You know that. Anyway. No, 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 it's not New York. Mr. Laurel's time. Kelly's pizza. Anyway, Mr. Chairman, I rise in strong support of the Price Amendment. Uh, since the 2016 campaign, President Trump has insisted that he wants an infrastructure package. The necessity of robust infrastructure investment is a bipartisan uh, pri uh, priority. Uh, moreover, infrastructure investment, what is it about? It, is, it creates jobs, jobs that cannot be outsourced, which is one of the problems that we have today. And we're looking at an economy where people are in jobs that don't pay them enough money to live on. If we are developing our infrastructure, that means we are creating the jobs as, as well as um, creating uh, what is much needed uh, in investment uh, that we know so much about from uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers. You know, this is a great country. It really is a great country. And if you look back on our history, um, if we can go back and take a, a look at DeWitt Clinton and the, and, the, and the steamboat. You can look at uh, 
of Teddy Roosevelt and our park system, Dwight Eisenhower and our road system across the country, Franklin Roosevelt uh, and electricity uh, coast to coast. Uh, so this is a nation that has been, been built on bricks and mortar and fiber optics and that investment in our infrastructure. Um, and as I say to date, the Trump administration has talked about this, but not delivered on, uh, um, on the promise. Um, the only investment that they have talked about in infrastructure is moving to privatize our infrastructure. I talked about that in this campaign. And the only thing that we've heard about so far is tax credits um, for very, very wealthy invest investors. Um, um, Congressman Price's amendment provides $200 billion in investment. Uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers estimated that if we continue status quo funding through 2025, each American household will lose $3,400 a year in disposable income due to poor infrastructure. We need to invest our in, con in our economy. This is the way to economic growth uh, and the way to increase revenue here. It's about our public safety. We need to treat our nation's infrastructure with the gravity that it deserves. I urge my colleagues to support Congressman Price's uh, uh, amendment. Thank uh, you, Mr. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Loro. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Kaptur may trump you just for a minute. <laughs> Ms. Kaptur, and then to Mr. Bishop. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I rise in strong support of the Price Amendment and thank the gentleman, Ranking Member, for offering it. President Eisenhower would know what we're talking about. We expected an infrastructure bill from President Trump. I don't know where it is. It's lost in uh, the stratosphere somewhere. Uh, while I agree with all the various provisions in this amendment, I'd like to focus my remarks on roads and bridges uh, through funding of the Federal Highway Administration. Of all the topics that were discussed in the recent campaign, the one that found the broadest support among the American people was the need to improve our infrastructure. And one of the important reasons for that is because it is a gigantic job creator, and particularly if U.S. materials are used in that construction. Uh, trucking companies, whenever they visit me, consistently ask for more funding to improve not just the state of our roads and bridges, but improve their own operations. They insist we should raise the gas tax because it would be cheaper to pay for more gas than dealing with all the wear and tear, billions of dollars uh, that uh, they expend annually uh, from the cost of crumbling highways that cause road, that cause vehicular damage. I can tell you in Ohio, the average citizen pays an extra $475 a year for car maintenance because Congress refuses to fund highway construction and upgrades. And I'm a personal witness to that, having had 500 bucks that I had to pay because we hit a pothole on uh, Christmas Eve about a year ago. And I thought, whoop, this is what we're talking about in Washington. They can't even get the roads fixed. Our transportation systems were the envy of the world, but without sustained support, we are falling further and further behind. I urge a yes vote, and I thank my friend from North Carolina for offering this really important amendment. I thank hope you. the president is listening. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Bishop. I should have gone with you. I thank the chairman. Um, I, I rise in support of uh, the Price Amendment. Uh, the amendment would make sound investments in infrastructure programs that would help repair the national housing crisis and restore highways and bridges. Uh, also, I'm pleased that his amendment would provide adequate funding for the Disaster Recovery Community Development Block Grant. Uh, on January 2nd and January 22nd of this year, uh, my hometown of Albany, Georgia, and areas in my district were ravaged uh, by storms and tornadoes, uh, destroyed nearly 400 uh, houses, demolished over 200 mobile homes, and over 400 additional homes sustained significant damage. Uh, over 1,100 homes were affected by the storm's rage. Uh, among both storms, 70% of the households in Doherty County were in the path of the storm. Uh, the storm systems damaged entire neighborhoods, schools, small businesses, uh, as well as uh, the re regional municipal utility infrastructure. The damage displaced over 5,000 residents. Five people lost their lives, and since then, the community has been making great strides to recover uh, to a state of normalcy. But these storms resulted in a presidential disaster declaration, uh, but despite the FEMA assistance, 
Hundreds of families are still in temporary housing, and there are unmet needs that are critical uh, to the community's long-term recovery plans. Uh, there are several other states that have suffered from natural disasters, and they continue to have unmet needs also. Uh, this amendment would allocate $5 billion in FY18 to aid long-term disaster recovery efforts for these states, including Georgia. So I encourage my colleagues to support the Price Amendment. Uh, it's a good amendment. It's good for our country, good for our infrastructure. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Ms. Lowy is recognized. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. There seems to be very strong support here this evening. And I want to rise in. Will the gentleman yield? I, mm. We had a debate on the staff whether food would accelerate the process or do the do the contrary, but uh, I'm not sure what's going on, but we've got it. The floor is yours. I hope you're enjoying your blueberry pie. <laughs> me, me too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Except where's the Alamode? Who's in the dairy district around <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Lowe is recognized. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do rise in strong support of Mr. Price's amendment because this amendment would rectify the serious shortcomings of this bill and demonstrate a more serious approach to meeting the vital infrastructure needs of our country. By restoring funding for TIGER, increasing programs like Amtrak, capital investment grants, and the airport improvement program, we can build a safer transportation and infrastructure network for our constituents and create jobs to help sustain our economy. On the housing side, the amendment makes a true long-term investment in popular programs our communities rely on, like CDBG, Public Housing Capital Fund, Choice Neighborhoods, Home, Housing for the Elderly, and Housing for the Disabled. We should make these investments now because it could be too late. If we continue kicking the can down the road on these important aspects of our country's infrastructure, we'll need more than we can afford to right our wrongs. So I urge strong support for this amendment. Thank you. Can, thank you, Ms. Lowe. Any further discussion? Now, Mr. Price, to close. Mr. Chairman, this amendment gives us a chance to deliver, to deliver for a change. Aren't you tired of just wringing your hands about the infrastructure and doing nothing about it? Aren't you tired of empty promises? The chairman has suggested that uh, that this amendment would prevent the bill from going to the floor. On the contrary, it's designed to go straight to the floor, straight to the floor. And it would go to the floor and be received with great enthusiasm. Finally, finally, we're getting this done. Finally, we're working in a bipartisan way. Finally, we're addressing the need for modernized highways, bridges, transit, ports, airports, housing, and community facilities. Finally, we're getting serious about creating thousands of well-paying jobs. Believe me, this country would breathe a huge sigh of relief. They might even conclude that we're putting our money where our mouth is. Please, support this amendment. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Price. The question's on the Price Amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. In the opinion of the chair, the nays have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Sufficient hands. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amaday. Mr. Amaday. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson. No. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. DeLauro. No. Ms. DeLauro, aye. Mr. Dent. No. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Ballard. No. Mr. diaz Ballard, no. Mr. Fleischman. No. Mr. Fortenberry. No. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelingheisen. No. 
Mr. Freelingheisen, no. Miss Granger, no. Miss Granger, no. Mr. Graves, Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris, Dr. Harris, no. Miss Herrera Butler, Miss Herrera Butler, no. Mr. Jenkins, Mr. Jenkins, no. Mr. Joyce, Mr. Joyce, no. Miss Captor, Miss Captor, I. Mr. Kilmer, Mr. Kilmer, I. Miss Lee, Miss Lee, I. Mrs. Lowy, Mrs. Lowy, I. Miss McCollum. Ms. McCollum, aye. Ms. Meng, Ms. Meng, aye. Mr. Molinar, Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse, Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo, Mr. Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree, Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan, Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price, Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley, Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby, Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney. Mr. Rooney, no. Miss Roybal Allard, Miss Roybal Allard, I. Mr. Rupersberger, Mr. Rupersberger, I. Mr. Ryan, Mr. Ryan, Mr. Serrano, Mr. Serrano, I. Mr. Simpson, Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Taylor, Mr. Taylor, no. Mr. Valadeo, Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Vesklosky, Mr. Vesklosky, I. Miss Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Womack, Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder, Mr. Yoder, no. Mr. Young, Mr. Young, no. Are there members who wish to record their vote or change their vote? Mr. Amaday. Mr. Amaday recorded as no. Anyone further? Not the clerk will tally. On this vote, the ayes are, uh, ayes, ayes are 21, the nays are 30. The amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Ms. Lee. Number one. Clerk will uh, read, please. An amendment offered by Ms. Lee. Ask for the reading to be waived. Consider done, you're recognized. Thank you. This amendment um, hopefully will be bipartisan. It, it's very simple. It would uh, keep open the doors of the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness by extending the sunset date to October 1st, 2020, it would increase the funding to $3.6 million, which is consistent with FY17 levels. My offset comes from the HUD IT account. Uh, homelessness is a very uh, complex and multifaceted problem. I'm sure everyone knows that. Uh, it can't be solved by any single agency, level of government, sector, or system on its own. That's why the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, also known simply as the Council, is so important. It brings together multiple agencies, including USDA, DOD, HHS, HUD, Department of Interior, Department of Veterans Affairs, OMB, Social Security, to improve federal collaboration in identifying high-impact strat high strategies to prevent and to end homelessness. This type of coordination is critical in our fight to ensure that everyone has a roof over their heads. Through improved collaboration, it bolsters direct investments and interventions at the community level to end homelessness. With more than 46 million Americans living in poverty and more than a half million Americans experiencing homelessness, we can't afford to close this council. <laughs> over the past several years, the Council has been critical to addressing the epidemic of homelessness affecting our nation. In 2020, the Council launched its federal strategic plan known as Opening Doors, which leverages local, state, and federal partnerships to address homelessness on every level. Their roadmap would address chronic homelessness and homelessness overall with the focus on veterans, families, and youth. This roadmap has helped the council reduce homelessness by an astounding 14% across the country. This includes reducing the number of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness by 25%. This means, of course, that fewer people are forced to live uh, on the sidewalks, in cars, in parks, and other outdoor locations. It's also made real substantial gains in addressing their long-term goals. For example, 
the council's efforts have helped drive homeless veterans, homelessness among veterans down by 47%. That's huge. They've also helped decrease family homelessness by 23%. This includes a 65% reduction in unsheltered homelessness among families. And chronic homelessness among individuals with disabilities is down 27%. Under the leadership of this council, 50 communities have now announced an end to homelessness among veterans. The statistics are clear. The Council's on Homeless Opening Doors strategic plan is working. It's on the decline overall, and more work needs to be done. And so I hope, Mr. Chairman, we can get support for this amendment because we should not not stop now. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, Chairman diaz Ballard. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Members, I, uh, I cannot, cannot support this amendment. Now look, the U.S. Energy Agency Council on Homelessness, it's done some good work, but make no mistake. You see, the, the, the program funds, that program funds bureaucrats. No problem with that. But it provides no direct service to the homeless. No direct service to the homeless. So what did we do in this bill? We prioritized funding for direct services to combat homelessness. The bill, by the way, and I hope you listen to this, the bill has $2.4 billion for homeless assistance grants. $2.4 billion. And within that amount, we provide $88 million above last year for direct services through the continuum of care providers. So again, the goal of the Interagency Council can easily be met by dedicating resources and personnel from within HUD and other agencies. I don't think we need a duplicate bureaucracy, especially when dollars can be better used, better spent, helping homelessness, homeless vets, the disabled, the elderly. But there's one more point I want to bring up. Last year, the Financial Services Committee brought a housing reform bill to the floor. You all remember, H.R. 3700. It passed with a unanimous vote on the floor of the House. Unanimous vote. And that bill did not include a sunset date extension for U.S. ICH. So <laughs> we all voted on that. So I don't think it's appropriate for this committee to override that unanimous decision by the authorizers just, again, not that long ago. So respectfully, I would urge a no vote on this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. diaz Ballard. Mr. Price is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I uh, rise in support of the amendment, would point out that it is paid for, and also that it would continue a, uh, the, the work of, a, of an agency that um, is universally recognized to not, a, not only have done good work, but have done absolutely essential work in delivering housing to populations that, that need it. And uh, it, uh, it has some unique qualities. It's a third party. It can look across multiple agencies, find ways to improve service delivery, recommend how best to streamline various procedures. Um, veterans housing is probably the proof of the pudding here, as uh, Ms. Lee has, uh, has indicated. Before the ICH got involved in the HUD-VASH program, there was a HUD program, there was a VA program. They were run as if they were two separate programs. But the ICH brought them together, brought the agencies together, created a more unified and effective program. That program now serves 90,000 veterans each year. Now we're going to hopefully be tacking youth homelessness, family homelessness with greater seriousness in the years ahead. This is exactly the kind of effort for which a coordinating role will be absolutely critical. For instance, a homeless youth might interact with programs from the Education Department, the Health and Human Services, HUD, state and local programs. It's going to be essential to coordinate and to deliver these services in a unified fashion. The US ICH ensures that these programs work together. It has a track record. It's not just another bureaucracy. It is a proven success. So uh, I support its work. We all should support this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Price. Further discussion? Ms. Pingree. 
I just rise in uh, support of Congresswoman Lee's amendment. I thank her for bringing it forward and finding a pay for as well mm -hmm. uh, for what is a very vital service. And I just wanted to give a quick example of how this has been successful in Maine. Um, in Maine, the statewide homeless council launched an effort through this program uh, to house long-term stayers. Those are defined as people staying over 180 days in shelters or living outdoors within a 365-day period. So this is a, a, a chronic problem for us. Homelessness is a challenge even in a rural state like Maine. But through their um, initiative, the Long-Term Stayers Initiative, they've been very successful and actually brought down the number of single adult long-term stayers in our state by 73% during the years from 2013 to 2017. So I think that's just a great success story for how this program has worked. The USICH took this best practice from Maine and has been showing other states <coughs> how to make similar efforts. So I, I just have to say in the problems of chronic homelessness, they've been very effective. This has been a great program in our state, and I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and yield back. Thank you, Ms. Pingree. Ms. McCollum is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise also in support of this amendment. Um, this interagency has done some tremendous work, and it does so because it brings for-profits, non-profits, communities together, along with state, local, federal agencies to figure out how, how to tackle homelessness. Now, we've heard all the wonderful examples about uh, what is going on with the, with the VA right now, and we've been the recipient of that in Minnesota. But I just want to take a second to talk about a group of people who are homeless that quite often don't get mentioned too often, and that is uh, the youth. In my home state of Minnesota, the most recent count in January 2017 identified nearly 1,200 1, homeless youth. Nationally, it's estimated 1.3, 1.7 million individuals under the age of 24 that are homeless. And folks, when you meet with these young adults and you hear their stories, some of them are escaping uh, horrific conditions. Um, but they need a place to be, a place <coughs> to be safe because they're preyed upon. So I think... Uh, the link in uh, in Minnesota is a non-profit housing provider, and it helps work with uh, homeless youth. Works with the school district. It coordinates things together, and that's part of what this agency does. It brings everybody together. The last thing I'll mention is uh, just recently, I was at a Native American-focused homeless shelter in St. Paul, and I'll tell you the hope and opportunity that those young adults were finally starting to feel because it was one-stop shopping for them, a safe place place where people focused on an education and made sure that they were safe. <coughs> I support the amendment. I yield Thank back. You. Thank you, Ms. McCollum. Ms. Kaptur. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, I rise in support of the, uh, in strong support of the Lee Amendment. At one point, uh, when I was first elected, I tried to figure out why the school attainment scores were so poor uh, in many of the schools that I represented. And in adopting those schools, I learned that one of the most important factors was that the child who entered school in September uh, was gone by May in another school and that thousands and thousands of children live in transient conditions where they're uprooted as many times as three times during the school year and they just can't gain footing. By grade three, we lose them. Uh, they can't catch up to their reading score. They can't read as fast and it just a, it's a cycle down from there. So these early years are extraordinarily important. I've had personal experience with the Interagency Council on Homelessness, and it seems like a simple thing. Uh, someone's homeless, you find them a place to stay. And if the federal government's involved, it's a long way from the local level. Uh, honestly, to create housing opportunity at the local level by blending a whole series of resources, locally, statewide, federally, private, philanthropic, is really very hard to do unless you've actually had to do it. And then you know how very much this interagency uh, council is needed because they can help one another, they can help talk about sources of financing, they can also, in the situation where children are psychiatrically or, uh, my God, now with the uh, opioid and, and heroin crisis, uh, not always able to go back to their family. Uh, in one of the districts that I represent in the greater Toledo area, we have 2,700 children who have no permanent shelter, uh, and they're part of this transient uh, upheaval that goes on in their lives. So I just think that we have finally created something that's working. 
because we have cut the rate of homelessness almost in half uh, in some groups in our society. So I would urge the gentleman to seriously think about what's been said here and uh, urge all of you to support the Lee Amendment so we can make sure that no American, particularly children, right. suffer from homelessness. Thank you, Ms. And Captain. Ms. Ms. Lee, a minute to close. Uh, we did vote to extend in, in the omnibus the uh, council until 2018. So my amendment extends it to uh, 2020. We voted on that. And I'd like us to consider this. And to uh, my colleague's uh, point about uh, direct services, we need direct services. I'm not saying that that is something we should take off the table because people need the direct um, help and services. But what the council does is really leverage our federal dollars to bring in more resources uh, to provide not only direct services, but to help people uh, move forward with their lives in terms of supportive services, in terms of transition housing, in terms of what they need to get, their, get back on their feet. Uh, the, their record speaks for itself. When you have a council, and this is just $3.4 million, uh, when you have a uh, council that can reduce veteran homelessness by 47 percent, uh, family homelessness by 23 percent, chronic homelessness for uh, people with disabilities by 27 percent. Something's working, and we should not stop now. We should move forward and continue to fund and extend this council so that we can leverage our federal dollars, because the private sector definitely would continue to support us in this effort. Thank you, Ms. Lee, for your comments. Questions on the Lee Amendment? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. No. In opinion of the chair, the, the uh, nays have it. Uh, sufficient hands, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Aye. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade. Aye. Mr. Amade, no. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark. Aye. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cuellar. Aye. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson. No. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. DeLauro. Aye. Ms. DeLauro, aye. Mr. Dent. Aye. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Blart. No. Mr. diaz Blart, no. Mr. Fleischman. Aye. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelinghuysen, no. Mr. Freelinghuysen, no. Mrs. Granger, no. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves, no. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris, Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. Mr. Jenkins, no. Mr. Jenkins, no. Mr. Joyce, no. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor, no. Ms. Captor, I. Mr. Kilmer, no. Mr. Kilmer, I. Ms. Lee, no. Ms. Lee, I. Mrs. Lowy, no. Mrs. Lowy, I. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum, aye. Ms. Meng. Aye. Ms. Meng, aye. Mr. Molinar. No. Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. No. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree. Aye. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Aye. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. Aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. Aye. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney. Aye. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard, aye. Mr. Rupersberger, Mr. Rupersberger, aye. Mr. Ryan, Mr. Serrano, Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson, Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Taylor, Mr. Taylor, no. Mr. Valadeo, Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Visklosky, Mr. Visklosky, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Womack, Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder, Mr. Yoder, no. Mr. Young. Mr. Young, no. Are there members who wish to record their vote or change their vote? Uh, seeing no one, uh, the clerk will tally. This vote, the A's are 21 and the nays are 30. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Graves is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk and ask that it be considered read. Mr. Clerk, Chairman uh, and, and committee, I, I have an amendment I intend to withdraw, but just real quickly wanted to, to make a couple of points. And, and 
I appreciate Mr. Uh, diaz Ballard and his work with me on the committee, and uh, we, we've had great, great results. And in this bill includes $800 million in rescissions of unobligated funds, which I fully support, and my amendment wouldn't do anything to impact that. But uh, one of the concerns I have for the state of Georgia, and I know for many other states in the room, is that when we're rescinding these unobligated funds, we're not providing enough flexibility to the states uh, to use the, the resources that still remain. So my amendment would remove some of those um, limitations and instead uh, provide them more flexibility. So really all I'm asking today is not for necessarily a vote on the amendment tonight, but maybe to work with the chairman as we move forward before we get to the floor on a vote to uh, see if there's a way that we can provide some additional uh, help to the states that uh, have limited resources, but if they just had a little bit more flexibility, they, they can make those limited resources go a little bit further and help their citizens a little bit more. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd welcome a response from the, uh, the subcommittee chairman. Thank you, Mr. Well. Graves. Mr. diaz Ballard. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I actually look forward to working with the gentleman. I know this is an issue that's very important to him, and I think we can improve on what we have, so I look forward to working with him, and I appreciate uh, his motion to withdraw. Great. Amendments you, withdrawn. Uh, further amendments. Uh, Mr. Serrano. And at the desk, and I'd like Clerk will read. An amendment offered by Mr. Serrano. If it's considered read, Mr. Serrano, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. My amendment uh, seeks to provide public housing authorities with more resources to perform the much-needed capital repairs within our public housing communities. As mentioned last year in full committee, it is truly time for us to take serious measures that will help improve the living conditions and health outcomes for public housing residents. As you may know, more than 1.1 million households currently live in public housing across the country, many of which are aging and falling apart. Public housing has been severely underfunded for decades, and as a result, our public housing stock has seen an increase in deterioration and a major backlog of capital repairs. Nationwide, 200,000 units of public housing have been lost in 2010, and 10,000 are at risk of being lost each year unless we act now to provide critical funding. Today, more than $26 billion is needed to address all public housing capital needs nationwide. In New York City alone, there's a capital backlog of more than $2 billion. My amendment kickstarts the process of addressing this critical funding gap. It increases the funding for the public housing capital fund by $5 billion, and it also carves out $600 million to target high-priority health hazards like mold reduction and lead paint removal. With that, I ask the members of this committee to support the adoption of this great amendment. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Serrano. Mr. Diaz-Ballard. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I unfortunately, again, cannot support this amendment because uh, it also causes the bill to exceed our allocation. So again, if, if adopted, as you all know, it would prevent the bill from going to the floor. I appreciate the gentleman, and he is a gentleman, I appreciate the gentleman's passion, but I would ask members to join me in opposing, opposing this amendment at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Price. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of uh, the Serrano Amendment. Uh, this. Um, Amendment would increase the public housing capital fund by $3.15 billion. The bill before us unfortunately cuts the public housing capital fund allocation from uh, uh, fiscal 17 to, to uh, fiscal 18 by, uh, by $92 million. Yet our nation's public housing infrastructure currently has a $26 billion maintenance backlog. In fact, capital repairs accumulate at a rate of $3.4 billion per year, far higher than the $1.85 billion contained in the base bill. We've been digging our nation into this hole for a long time, and this amendment would help us finally start making progress to address it. In 2016, 90% of public housing households were elderly, had disabilities, worked, had recently worked, or were subject to work requirements through another program. 54% of the families in public housing are elderly or disabled and earn an average family income of $13,000 a year. The number of public housing units has fallen by more than 250,000 since the mid-90s. 
only a small share of the removed units have been replaced with new public housing. If adopted, this amendment would begin to improve the quality of life for a vulnerable population, and I urge its adoption. Chair, recognize Ms. Ming for her, any comments she may wish. Um, as an original co-sponsor of Mr. Serrano's bill that addresses the same issue, I also support this amendment. It is crucial that funding for the Public Housing Capital Investment Fund be increased in order to address the capital needs and costs of maintaining the basic public housing infrastructure. The health and safety of our constituents is endangered on a daily basis by fixable problems. Lead and mold can be removed, and we can repair leaky roofs to prevent the growth of mold. Elevators for seniors, children, and the disabled should be repaired. As Mr. Serrano mentioned, there is a $26 billion in public housing capital needs, $17 billion of which directly impacts New York City, and this amendment to increase funding will address those needs. I support this amendment because it is imperative that we take care of the basic public housing infrastructure in our communities and take the health and safety of our constituents seriously. Thank you, Ms. Ming. Any further discussion? Uh, if uh, back to Mr. Serrano for a minute to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I suspect that tonight and many other nights we're going to hear about exceeding our allocation. I think back to when I was a child and seeing Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, inaugurating Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. And I remember reading about uh, the building of the East Side Highway. And I remember building of the subway system in New York. Now, speaking just about my city, of all those roads that went out west, of all those bridges that went out to different parts of the country, yes, we have to be budget conscious, but we also have to invest in the future of our country. And this particular part is where some of the most neediest people live, and it's falling apart. And we can keep this housing going. We can help it rebuild, restore itself, be strong, but we have to be willing to invest. I know when I say invest, somebody over there in a low breath says, spend. It is investment. We didn't become the greatest country on earth by not investing in our present and in our future. This is what we're doing here. This is what we've done since the beginning of time, and we shouldn't stop now. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Serrano. Questions on the... Uh, Gentleman from New York's uh, amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Nay. No. Opinion of the chair, the nays have it. Seeing sufficient hands, the clerk will quickly call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade. Mr. Amade, no. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cuellar. Aye. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson. Aye. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. Deloro. Ms. Deloro, aye. Mr. Dent. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. Diaz Ballart. Mr. Diaz Ballart, no. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelinghuisen. Mr. Freelinghuisen, no. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins, no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor, aye. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer, aye. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCullum. Ms. McCullum, aye. Ms. Meng. Ms. Meng, aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no, Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree, aye, Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, aye, Mr. Price. Aye. Mr. Price, aye, Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, aye, Mrs. Roby. Aye. Mrs. Roby, no, Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no, Mr. Rooney. Mr. Rooney, no, Ms. Roy Allard. Ms. Roy Allard, aye, Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger, aye, Mr. Ryan. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano, aye, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, no, Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, no, Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, no, Mr. Visklosky. Mr. Visklosky, aye, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. 
Ms. Wasserman Schultz, Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no, Mr. Yoder. No. Mr. Yoder, no, Mr. Young. No. Mr. Young, no. Other members who wish to record their vote or change their vote? Uh, seeing no one, the clerk will tally. On this vote, the A's are 21, the nays are 30, the amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Palazzo is recognized. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read. An amendment yes, offered by Mr. Considered Palazzo. Considered read and gentlemen is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'm introducing this with the intention of withdrawing the amendment, but wanted to first speak on this very important issue. My colleague, Mr. Serrano, and I are introducing this amendment to bring awareness to funding issues affecting public housing authorities and how these funding shortfalls negatively impact their ability to provide housing to low-income residents. Each year, PHAs receive enough capital funding to address only about half of their newly occurring physical needs. Although this amendment speaks to capital fund shortages, it should be noted that the operating fund, which supports the day-to-day -day management of public housing, also continues to be prorated about 86 percent as of now. Meaning, compared to what PHAs have told us that they need, we're still over $6 billion short. I understand that these are very tight budgetary times. However, if we're not going to provide full funding, we have to cut down on the regulations taking up valuable time and limited resources. I greatly appreciate the chairman and the subcommittee for including some very helpful deregulatory language. I also strongly support the language related to the public housing mortgage program. It is a prime example of how we can modify existing laws to better suit PHAs in the absence of more money. PHMP could be a useful tool to address public housing capital needs. To conclude, public housing reform is a bipartisan issue. Every state and every district has public housing. Of course, providing PHAs with the money they need, whether it be adequate capital funding, operating funding, or voucher administrative fees would be the ideal scenario. In its absence, we should work to make sure PHAs can do their job effectively, because if we maintain the status quo here, that is underfunding coupled with overregulations and reporting requirements, we will continue to lose more public housing, more vouchers, and in turn assist fewer and fewer families in need. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to give my colleague, Mr. Serrano, um, the opportunity. I think he might have wanted to say a few. Well, maybe first. we'll recognize the chairman first, and then uh, we'll be okay. happy to hear from well. Mr. Serrano. <clears throat> I would be happy to hear from Mr. Serrano. <laughs> we would. Uh, Mr. diaz Bellard. Mr. Chairman, look, I, I just want to, I want to tell the gentleman that I, I really look forward to uh, working with him. I think he's brought up some issues. Uh, we've talked about this, and I, I look forward to working with him and with Mr. Serrano and the rest of the committee on on this issue. Again, I appreciate his, uh, uh, he's going to withdraw this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Diaz. Mr. Serrano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I realize you just wanted me to speak after I heard the bad news. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of this Palazzo Serrano amendment. Boy, that sounds like two opera singers. I love it. <laughs> Palazzo, not Palazzo. <laughs> I said Palazzo. <laughs> He's Palazzo, speak up on your amendment. Well, it, it, in Sicilian, it is Palazzo. Okay. <laughs> to Mr. Serrano, you're good to go. Thank you, Mr. He, he corrected the chairman. He may not be doing as well as I thought. I don't know. <laughs> I am withdrawing the amendment, by the way. <laughs> Which is a bipartisan effort that would take the first steps needed to address the public housing crisis that we're currently facing. I would like to thank my dear friend and colleague from New York, Ms. Velasquez, who has dedicated countless hours to this important issue. Our amendment mirrors her bipartisan efforts in the Financial Services Committee and has been adopted in their oversight plan. Mr. Chairman, as mentioned countless times today, chronic underfunding remains a threat to over 1. million households living in public housing units across the country. This amendment takes a very simple approach to address this critical public housing issue. It instructs HUD to study the effects of public housing on residents who face severe health consequences as a result of living in these rapidly deteriorating units. 
This amendment would allow HUD to investigate and report back to us the connection between the level of funding of the Public Housing Capital Fund and its impact on public housing authorities and their ability to ensure their families are housed in safe and secure units. To date, we have yet to receive a study that solely focuses on the needs of public housing residents and the public housing authorities entrusted to oversee their care. And my amendment, our amendment, would do just that. With that, I strongly encourage my colleagues to cross the aisle to ignore the fact that Mr. Palazzo is going to withdraw the amendment and vote for it anyway. Thank you. The Palazzo Serrano amendment is withdrawn, but uh, do you care to comment, Mr. Price? No. Okay. Uh, further uh, amendments? I think Ms. Lee or, or Ms. Clark, it's your birthday. Do you mind if Ms. Clark goes first? Mm -hmm. Or Mr. Price, excuse me. Right. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment that asks price number two. Uh, clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Price. Price. The gentleman will proceed. Mr. Chairman, as I noted uh, at the beginning of this, uh, of this markup, there, um, there is some good news with respect to, uh, to transit in this bill. All right, it's number three, sorry. This is the, the bill having to do with uh, capital investment grants. Uh, 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 price number three. All right. Uh, the clerk, do you want the clerk to read or you're going to No, we have to dispense with that. Uh, okay. Uh, the news with respect to transit is, uh, is, n is not all bad. In fact, uh, I'm grateful to, to the chairman for, uh, for what he has um, done in this bill to, uh, to get right with, uh, with transit and with this country's um, transit needs. Uh, the report notes the importance of public transit and the benefits that it provides. And the fact that there's any funding in this bill at all shows that this committee values the national benefits of transit and rejects the Trump administration's uh, short-sighted proposal to eliminate capital investment grants. I'm also pleased that the bill and the report include strong direction to DOT to continue administering the New Starts program. And, the, and, and to do that in a manner that we've come to expect. The projects in the pipeline need certainty, above all certainty, if they're ever going to come to fruition. So while this uh, bill does save the Capital Investment Grants Program from the cutting room floor, the funding is still uh, fal false for sure. It's, it's, it's inadequate. It doesn't um, move the projects in the pipeline along in a timely manner. The New Starts program would, would greatly suffer at these funding levels. So that's what my amendment uh, attempts to rectify. It would increase the funding for the Capital Investment Grants Program to the level authorized in the FAST Act. And that would be an increase of $550 million. This funding will ensure that we can take care of the projects currently in the construction as well as in construction as well as to move ready and worthy projects from the engineering phases into the construction phase. We often focus on the local benefits of these projects, increased mobility, improved access to opportunity. The Capital Investment Grants Program also supports a broad industrial base in this country. That the, supports thousands of jobs. For instance, the, the new rail cars on DC's uh, Metro Lines, Metro Silver Line. They were assembled in Mr. Fortenberry's district, as I'm sure he knows. The parts were sourced from suppliers in Mr. Quigley's district, and on it goes. So I do applaud Chairman diaz Villard and Chairman Frelinghuysen for the support for transit in the base bill. But I just have to say that we need to do much more, and that's what my amendment uh, would accomplish. Thank you, Mr. Price. Uh, Mr. diaz Villard, and then I believe Ms. Lowy was seeking time. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I obviously look forward to working with the ranking member, continue to working with the ranking member, uh, because I also support, obviously, uh, uh, this grant program. But unfortunately, I cannot support this amendment. I cannot support this amendment because it causes the bill to exceed our allocation. And again, it would prevent the bill from going to the floor. And again, since I do look forward to working with the ranking member throughout this process, hopefully in conference, we got to get the bill to the floor, and this amendment would uh, make that more difficult. So that's why I respectfully would ask, ask for a no vote on this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
you. Uh, Ms. Clark, I believe, or Mr. Fiskowski here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I simply rise in strong support of the price amendment for the very reasons I mentioned in my opening remarks. Again, appreciate that the chairman uh, filled the hole up to $500 million, but the need is great. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Fiskowski. Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to rise in support of my colleague's amendment and express gratitude to the chairman for uh, his uh, uh, expression of support for these investments. Um, yeah, I was certainly disappointed by the president's pr proposal to eliminate this altogether, and I, I think I was particularly disappointed by the rationale for it, suggesting that because uh, state and local governments were raising their own capital, that the federal government would, in essence, pull the rug out from under them. And I think that's, that's really the wrong approach. This is exactly the kind of partnership that we want to encourage communities to put skin in the game and make these sorts of investments. Listen, this is, this is a big deal in, in my neck of the woods. We're seeing uh, in the greater Seattle area an effort underway to expand commuter rail service. That's important. That's important. Um, uh, for getting cars off the road. As someone who drove to the airport this morning, I can tell you the speed limit signs, I think, are there um, just for nostalgic purposes. Uh, and so getting cars off the road is a good thing. Um, imp imp improving the flow of commerce on Interstate 5, that is a good thing. Uh, reducing wear and tear on our roads and bridges, that is a good thing. Um, the Linwood Link represents one of the first phases uh, in this multi-year plan. As of June, over $200 million has been secured, but unfortunately, uh, uh, the committee's proposal would leave this project and others like it's stalled for fiscal year 2018. So if we're serious about modernizing this infrastructure, my hope is that we can con continue the success of this program, and I appreciate the chairman in Joe. that regard. Ms. Royal Bell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to associate myself with the remarks of, of Congressman Price and uh, Mr. Kilmer on his amendment which seeks to safeguard the New START program. From my own personal experience in working to advance the New START's transit project in my congressional district, I can confidently assert that the New START program provides a solid value for the American taxpayer. By smartly matching federal funds with local funds, the New START's program is able to leverage funding create a true, reliable, and equitable partnership between local transportation agencies and the federal government. And I would note that the process of securing federal New Starts funding for a transit project is rigorous, requiring detailed studies, both environmental and economic, to ensure that the American taxpayer gets a solid piece of infrastructure that will reliably serve the American public for decades to come. For these reasons, I encourage my colleagues to support the Price Amendment. I thank the gentleman for her comments. Mr. Ruppersberger. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of my colleague's amendment, uh, which would restore promised funding to rail projects around the country. Uh, the Capital Investment Grant Program allows states and local governments to leverage federal dollars to improve our rail systems. The committee has recommended a cut of over a half a billion dollars to this account. The administration funded a good number of these projects because their applications were not signed in ink. Yet most of these projects have been in development for decades. An example is Maryland's Purple Line. If approved, this light rail line, which would run parallel to I-495 in Maryland, the construction of this line will relieve congestion on the Beltway and allow greater mobility in the greater Washington area. Uh, as Mr. Kilmer stated, both the state and its partners have agreed to shoulder a large portion of this financing. This is a sh this I-95 project is a shovel-ready project that is simply waiting on the federal dollars that they thought were previously secured. This project will create jobs. The termination of projects like this means that millions of dollars in planning have gone to waste. I urge uh, that we move forward with this project. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. Mr. Aguilar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today I wanted to speak in support of Ranking Member uh, Price's amendment as well. The Capital Investment Grant Accounts administers three grant programs, including New Starts, Small Starts, and Core Capacity, which collectively support different transit projects, such as light rail, streetcars, commuter rail, and bus rapid transit. Cities and towns across this country, including those in my district of San Bernardino County, are investing in transportation and infrastructure projects to increase safe and efficient public transportation options. 
adding funds to the capital investment grants account will allow us to continue supporting and leveraging those local dollars to transportation projects throughout the country that connect cities and towns and create safe and reliable transportation for American workers, ease traffic congestion, and generate local jobs. I urge the committee to support this amendment. Thank the gentleman from California for comments. A minute to close, Mr. Price. Mr. Chairman, just as a uh, technical matter, um, the objection that, um, that this amendment would exceed our allocation really isn't, uh, isn't credible because uh, at this moment we have no allocation. We have no allocation. Um, this is an amendment that uh, does not provide uh, lavish funding. It does not provide uh, the level of funding that I think uh, would have uh, the, the best uh, effect on our country. It simply brings us up to the fast Act uh, authorization level, and it would let us keep moving these projects all across the country, keep them advancing. There's not a single one of those projects that is not meritorious. There's not a single one of those projects that hasn't um, advanced, that has advanced without intense scrutiny. Not a single one of those projects that doesn't have local funding, that hasn't leveraged funding from, uh, from other sources and is ready to go has been years in the making. We can't let our communities and our constituents uh, down. This is the least they can expect from us. Uh, please vote for this amendment. Okay, thank you, Mr. Price. The question's on the Price Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. No. Pin in the chair, the nays have it. Uh, yes, requisite number. The clerk will call the roll, please. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade, Mr. Amade, no. Mr. Bishop, yes. Mr. Bishop, yes. Mr. Calvert, Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter, Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright, Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark, Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cuellar, Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson, Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. Deloro, Ms. Deloro, aye. Mr. Dent, Mr. Dent, no. Mr. Diaz Bellart. Mr. Diaz Bellart, no. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry, Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelinghuisen, no. Mr. Freelinghuisen, no. Miss Granger, Miss Granger, no. Mr. Graves, Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris, Dr. Harris, no. Miss Herrera Butler, Miss Herrera Butler, no. Mr. Jenkins, Mr. Jenkins, no. Mr. Joyce, Mr. Joyce, no. Miss Captor, Miss Captor, I. Mr. Kilmer, aye. Mr. Kilmer, I. Miss Lee, Miss Lee, I. Mrs. Lowy. Mrs. Lowy, I. Miss McCollum, Miss McCollum, I. Miss Meng, Miss Meng, I. Mr. Molinar, Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse, Miss Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo, Mr. Palazzo, no. Miss Pingree, Miss Pingree, I. Mr. Pocan, Mr. Pocan, I. Mr. Price, Mr. Price, I. Mr. Quigley, Mr. Quigley, I. Mrs. Roby, Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney, no. Mr. Rooney, no. Miss Roybal Allard, Miss Roybal Allard, I. Mr. Rupesberger, Mr. Rupesberger, I. Mr. Ryan, Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Serrano, I. Mr. Simpson, Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Taylor, Mr. Taylor, no. Mr. Valadeo, Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Visklosky, Mr. Visklosky, I. Miss Wasserman Schultz, Miss Wasserman Schultz, I. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder, Mr. Yoder, no. Mr. Young. Are there any members who wish to record their votes or change their votes? Uh, seeing no one, the clerk will tally. On this vote, the A's are 21, the nays are 30, the amendment's not agreed to. Um, Ms. Lowy is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk, Lowy number one. The clerk will read. An amendment oh, offered by... Consider the red and a uh, gentlewoman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment would add $199 million for positive train control implementation. Positive uh, Train Control, or PTC, is a critical safety technology that will prevent derailments 
and other train accidents caused by train operator or dispatcher error. PTC will reduce the number of accidents resulting from excessive speed, conflicting train movements, engineer failure to obey signals along the tracks. The FAST Act, signed into law in 2015, requires PTC to be implemented along all passenger railroads by December 31st, 2018, but many commuter railroads will miss that deadline because of financial hardship. To date, the federal government has provided about $1.2 billion in loans and grants for PTC implementation, and that's a far cry from the Federal Railroad Administration's $14 billion estimate to implement full PTC. My colleagues, you have already rejected Mrs. P Mr. Price's amendment to provide a billion dollars in grants for PTC implementation, a number closer to the actual need. My amendment would appropriate $199 million, which is equal to the fiscal year 2017 enacted level. Accepting my amendment would invest in life-saving technology that will make American railroads safer for all passengers, and I urge you to support my amendment. Thank you, Ms. Lowy. Chairman Diaz Ballard. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, the FAST Act authorized money to help states, local governments, and transit agencies, as you heard, implement positive train control for one year. And we provided the full, the full $199 million last year which, by the way, is the only authorized bill. And so, again, at this stage, I, I cannot support this amendment, Mr. Chairman. This amendment is, un is unauthorized, but it also uh, comes with no offset, which would exceed our allocation. So, again, if adopted, mm -hmm. this amendment would prevent this bill, this good bill, from going to the floor. So I will have to ask, respectfully uh, urge a no vote on this amendment. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Price is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I rise uh, in support of the Lowy Amendment. Uh, positive crane control offers many uh, clear safety benefits, efficiency improvements to our freight passenger and commuter rail systems. Some commuter uh, lines are doing pretty well with this. Uh, Metrolink in Southern California, for example, will meet the 2018 implementation deadline. But many of the largest commuter railroads are struggling to deploy PTC by the deadline. PTC deployment is complex. It involves integrating components, the train and track coupled with communication systems, it relies on train staff. So we need the resources, and it's clear that this critical safety technology uh, will save lives. It does depend on our uh, adequate funding, so I support the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Price. Mr. Serrano, uh, were you seeking time? If not, uh, for Well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Okay, uh, where are we? Uh, questions on the, on the, the Ms. Lowy to close. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make it very clear that implementing positive train control will save countless lives. So I urge my colleagues to support my amendment. Thank you, Mr. Lowy. Questions on the Lowy amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Opinion of the chairs and nays have it, the amendment is not agreed to. Sufficient hands, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade. Mr. Amade, no. Mr. Bishop. Yes. Mr. Bishop, yes. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark. Aye. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. DeLauro. Aye. Ms. DeLauro, aye. Ms. Diaz, Mr. diaz Villart. Mr. diaz Villart, no. Mr. I'm s sorry, Mr. Dent. Mr. Dent, no. Thank you. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelingheisen. Mr. Freelingheisen, no. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins, no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor, aye. Mr. Kilmer. Aye. Mr. Kilmer, aye. Ms. Lee. Aye. 
Miss Lee, I. Mrs. Lowy. Mrs. Lowy, I. Miss McCollum. Miss McCollum, I. Miss Meng. Miss Meng, I. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no. Miss Pingree. Miss Pingree, I. Mr. Pocan. Miss Poc. Mr. Pocan, I. Mr. Price. Mr. Price, I. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, I. Mrs. Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney. Mr. Rooney, no. Miss Roybal Allard. Miss Roybal Allard, I. Mr. Rupersberger. Mr. Rupersberger, I. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano, I. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Vesklosky. Mr. Vesklosky, I. Miss Wasserman Schultz. Miss Wasserman Schultz, I. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, no. Mr. Young. Mr. Young, no. Are there members who wish to record their vote or change their vote? Uh, say no, and the clerk will tally. Way through. On this vote, the A's are 21, the nays are uh, 30. The agreement, uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Ms. Clark, I believe, is recognized first. Ms. Clark. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. And Michael Reed. I would dispense an amendment. Right. The gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I rise to offer and then withdraw an amendment to restore the Which funding. Which you have several amendments? Amendment or? one. Amendment one, please. Uh, for the tenant protection voucher program, uh, especially in light of the fact that we did not pass Mr. Serrano's amendment that would have restored funding to the public housing capital fund. Um, in 2010, HUD estimated that nationwide there was a $26 billion deferred ma maintenance backlog in public housing units. And that backlog grows at a rate of $3.4 billion a year. In New York City Housing Authority alone this year, estimated deferred maintenance backlog is $17 billion. When public housing becomes so dilapidated that it must be demolished or completely renovated, Existing tenants are displaced and must be relocated. Public housing agencies use the tenant protection vouchers to ensure that these tenants are not made homeless. I understand that due to HUD's uh, underutilization of these vouchers and their decision to fund these vouchers at less than the full rate, there is carryover in the account this year. However, that does not mean there is not substantial need for these vouchers and the $50 million cut under this bill will be of real concern uh, nationwide and in my district where many low-income housing units are both in need of substantial renovation and are nearing the end of their below market rate contract protections and facing market rate conversion. Cambridge Housing Authority is currently applying to HUD for an obsolescence finding on five different properties so they can renovate and convert them. Unfortunately, HUD appears to be dragging their feet on processing those applications, and I would ask for your assistance, Mr. Chairman, to help ensure that HUD provides their long overdue responses to these applications. Regardless, without tenant protection vouchers, these projects and others like them will not happen. When we underfund the capital fund, we force public housing agencies to rely on RAD conversions and other sources of private capital to ensure that housing stock remains available. That pro process does not work without tenant protection vouchers. And while I'm withdrawing my amendment, I hope that the funding reductions in this account can be addressed as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to withdraw. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Uh, Chairman diaz Ballard. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, just uh, for brevity, I'll just uh, I'll just uh, waive my time. And, and he thanks you for withdrawing your amendment. I, I do. Uh, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk, and I ask an amendment on. Considered read. The gentlewoman from Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
my colleagues, a recent story out of Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport detailed how a passenger unleashed an unprovoked and violent assault on an airline employee, punching her in the head, dragging her to the ground by her hair, and repeatedly, repeatedly kicking her in the stomach. Now, just about all of us in this room regularly use the airlines to come back and forth from our districts, and I'm sure that we all could tell our own set of horror stories that we've witnessed when you have an irate and frustrated passenger verbally, and in many cases from all that I've read recently, often physically assaulting airport personnel, particularly those who work for airlines, who when they aren't getting their way, when they are frustrated about their travel plans being changed, are extremely aggressive and inappropriate. And I can't tell you the number of times that I know I have thought to myself, gosh, you catch more bees with honey. Does this person really think that they are going to get this flight attendant or this gate agent or this ticket counter agent to be more helpful the way they're treating them? And yet people every day continue to abuse airline personnel. These incidents of airport rage are not unique and they are rising in frequency. Too often passengers take their anger and aggressions out on frontline employees through verbal and physical assaults. But passenger service agents working at airport ticket counters, clubs, and gates have been continuously attacked by passengers during fits of airport rage. These employees are the public face of their companies, and they're the true intermediary and liaison to the American people. Yet their employees, employers do not guarantee fundamental workplace protections and often hide these incidents afraid of the negative tweets and PR that it may generate. No employee should go to work each day afraid he or she may be physically or verbally assaulted. Moreover, American corporations have a duty to their employees to provide basic and fundamental workplace protections. In January, the Departments of Justice and Transportation clarified that these passenger service agents are covered by the Aviation and Transportation Security Act, confirming that an assault on an agent is a federal crime and should be treated as one. However, there is still work to be done to ensure that airport rage incidents are treated appropriately by law enforcement, the airlines, and airport personnel. This amendment would require airlines to establish employee assault prevention and response plans and submit them to the, federal, to, to the FAA. These plans must set the protocols for agent reporting, immediate law enforcement notification and procedure, handling assault of pass passengers, passenger education, and passenger service agent training. Instead of hiding these incidents, our airlines must systematically address this issue. And so I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and would love to hear what the chairman of the committee thinks. And I would remind the chairman of the committee before he stands up and gives his opinion that we fly into and out of the same airports. And I'm sure you don't want stale pretzels or uh, you know, the, uh, the, the nice folks who take care of us every time we fly in and out of MIA to, uh, to be mad at you. Well, uh, Think carefully. thank the gentlewoman for her comments, and, and how could the chairman not respond? Mr. Chairman, after that one, I, uh, <laughs> kudos to the great, wonderful men and women who serve us when we travel. <laughs> uh, look, I look forward to working with the gentlelady. She's a passionate advocate for uh, folks back home. I, I'm not, I think she was going to uh, withdraw this amendment, but having said that, I, I look forward to working with you. Yeah. Well, good. I was particular in saying great things about the folks that serve us back. Home. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, but for me, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, it's critical that a clear process, mandated protocols, and an education program are developed and shared with law enforcement, airport security, our airlines, and passenger agents. We have to make sure that these people who are just doing their jobs and trying to both keep us keep us safe, the traveling public, as well as make sure that we have a pleasant experience that they don't have to fear for their safety every time they step behind their podiums. So with that and the commitment of the chairman to, uh, to work with us towards achieving this goal, I would draw the amendment. I thank you both. Ms. McCollum on, on this uh, with on, amendment. On this amendment. Um, You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I stand before you as a 63-year-old daughter of a flight attendant. She was called a stewardess in those days. When she got married, they took her off the plane, they put her on the ticket counter. When they found out she was pregnant, they said, nice knowing you. I heard my mother tell stories uh, back, back 63 years ago of some of the confrontations and some of the dangerous things that were going on in planes and what was expected of her. And I er learned early on they are not 
glorified waitresses. These are people who um, put your safety uh, first before their own. But the ticket agents and the gate agents, and I think we've all experienced this over the years, especially here with the flight delays and that, the verbal abuse, just the verbal abuse alone has gotten out of hand. So I would hope, Mr. Chair, that we work with the airlines, and many of them are doing an outstanding job trying to uh, help their employees. But I'm going to add something. It's up to all of us when we see somebody being verbally abused, a ticket agent, a flight attendant, a gate agent, you know, we should say, hey, stop it. Thank the woman for the amendment. Yeah, thank you, Ms. McCollum. Remarks on target. target. Uh, 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 further amendments? Uh, Mr. DeLauro, you were about to be, re are you, would you like to be recognized? Do we have an amendment at the desk? Clerk, clerk will. An amendment you? offered by yeah. Ms. DeLauro. Consider read the gentlewoman from Connecticut is, uh, recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this amendment would restore funding to the TIGER program to the uh, fiscal year 2017 level. The current bill completely eliminates the TIGER program, despite the fact that all across the country, TIGER grants have invested in road, rail, transit, and port projects that achieve vital national objectives. The projects chosen for these competitive grants undergo a rigorous and well-defined process that includes ensuring that they will move fast and create good-paying jobs immediately. Tiger grants are competitive and they are merit-based. They are often much needed projects that are multimodal, multi-jurisdictional, or otherwise challenging to fund through other existing programs. The states of, s of so many of our members in this room will benefit and uh, of others have seen the benefit of these uh, Tiger grants in the past. And if you just bear with me for a, no a moment, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Freelingheisen, 2016 Tiger Award was $16.2 million uh, to support the accelerated replacement of the century-old portal bridge across the Hackensack River. Mr. diaz Ballart in Florida, 2014 Tiger Award, $20 million toward replacing the Tamiani Trail. Uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, uh, Kentucky, 2014 Tiger Award, $24 million for widening and expansion of the Mountain Parkway in eastern Kentucky. Mr. Fleischman of Tennessee, 2014 Tiger Award, $400,000 towards City of Chattanooga Rail Transit Implementation Plan. Mr. Adderholt in Alabama, 2016 Tiger Award for $14.4 million for one um, mobile project uh, which will reconstruct uh, Broad and Beauregard Streets. Mr. Stewart of Utah, 2016 Tiger Award in his state for $20 million for the Utah Transit Authority. I mention this because, and I can talk about those in my district, $12 million, $16 million. You could probably go around this room and identify the, the uh, districts or the states that have received Tiger grants because they are uh, very important development opportunities. Where did this angry go? Sorry. Um, we face an infrastructure crisis in this country. Others have gotten up and spoken about it. We talked about the American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, estimated that if we continue uh, the status quo funding to 2025, each American household will lose $3,400 a year in disposable income due to poor infrastructure. If the gap between what we spend and what we need to spend to address infrastructure is not addressed by 2025, the economy could lose almost $4 trillion in GDP, costing the economy two and a half million jobs, which is staggering. We are putting Americans at risk by failing to invest in our nation's infrastructure. Transportation costs are the second greatest household expense after housing, with an average American family spending more than $9,500 per year. At a time when infrastructure investment is critical for the safety and economic security of working Americans, we cannot eliminate one of the most important tools we have to improve our roads, our rails, and other transportation modes. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Laura. Uh, Chairman diaz Ballard. Mr. Chairman, as we all know, Tiger is not authorized and was not requested by the administration, so it, frankly it's unclear how DOT would choose to prioritize funding for such programs. Now, instead, and we had to make choices, right? So instead, this bill provides 
significant increases for authorized infrastructure programs. For example, under the Federal Railroad Administration, the bill provides $500 million for the federal state partnership for the state of good repair. So again, we have to make choices in this bill. We're going to, I look forward to continuing working uh, with uh, uh, the distinguished member and all of you, but at this stage, I cannot support this amendment. Again, also because it will cause a bill to exceed our allocation. And if adopted, as you all well know, it would prevent the bill from going to the floor. So I would ask respectfully members to join me in opposing this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. diaz -Ballard. Mr. Price is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I uh, stand in support of uh, my, my colleague's uh, amendment, and she's uh, done, a, done quite a good job, I think, of, uh, of indicating just how useful and how positive this program has been all around the country. I certainly can, uh, can testify to that. A very unusual, exciting project, uh, Union Station in the city of, of Raleigh, a multimodal transit center. That's the sort of thing that Tiger specializes in, and, and it's not easily replaced. It's not replicated by other, other grant programs. It, uh, it's, it supports regional projects, interstate projects, projects that are challenged to, challenging to fund in any other way. And the demand is enormous. Just in the last uh, fiscal year, we had 500 million in, uh, in Tiger funding available. There were 590 applications for that. They were from all 50 states, from the District of Columbia, the territories. They totaled more than $9.3 billion. So do the math. I mean, we're funding about 5% of the meritorious projects that, uh, that could be funded, that need to be funded. Tiger's a very innovative program. I know it's associated with the last administration. Surely that's uh, not a good enough reason for eliminating this funding. Support the gentlewoman's amendment. Mr. Price, Ms. Ms. Lowe is recognized, and then uh, Mr. Quigley. I would just like to say to our distinguished chairman that not being authorized is probably not the best rationale for not supporting this program because it is so essential in our communities across the country. And by the way, my colleagues, I just want to inform you, inform you if, you're not, if I'm not mistaken, that CDBG has never been authorized. And I would say that the majority of my friends on the other side of the aisle have enjoyed uh, bringing home funds to their communities for CDBG. This is such an important program, and I want to applaud my friend for, again, bringing all the virtues of this program to our attention. And I do hope that we can all support it. But don't say you're not supporting it because it's not authorized. Thank you, Ms. Lowy. Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank Ms. DeLora for uh, introducing this amendment. Uh, it is an extraordinarily effective program. I'm not sure how to allocate these funds in a more effective way. And it also requires matching local funds. It creates jobs. I mean, eliminating Tiger Grants is extraordinarily counterintuitive and detrimental to transportation infrastructure in urban and rural areas represented by Republicans and Democrats. It makes absolutely no sense to cut funds to projects that enhance the safety and social mobility of millions of Americans uh, on a daily basis. Thank you. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to say a few words on behalf of this amendment. I'm also speaking for Ms. McCollum, who is gradually losing her voice, and so uh, I'm also uh, her proxy, although I don't need the extra time, uh, so you can thank me later. Uh, the, the, the Tiger Grant Program allows cities and, and towns across this nation, including mine in San Bernardino County, to invest in projects that spur economic development. You've heard those examples, you've heard those stories, but one of the other reasons um, is also as a former city official, I cannot tell you how critical these programs are to help us and to partner with us uh, and to use as leveraged funds as we move forward with our local projects. Um, but I'll also say, um, you know, we've seen on the other on the other side. Um, you know, Senator Collins has has spoken in favor of the Tiger program, and I think her quote was, and I pulled it up. She said, "I'm not zeroing it out. So while it may not be authorized now, um, uh, we're going to have to deal with this uh, in the near future." And I'd and I'd suggest that uh, our colleagues uh, look at how we find a solution uh, to this issue in the short term. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Laura. To close, w one minute to close. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, 
I, I, I would bet that every community represented in this room this evening has, uh, or state has been the beneficiary of a Tiger Grant. I would also bet that everyone went to uh, the uh, groundbreaking uh, for the Tiger uh, uh, project. Uh, I certainly did in the downtown crossing a, a $12 uh, million dollar project in the city of New Haven. Uh, which not only uh, created jobs, but helped to uh, grow the uh, 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 Alexion, which deals in uh, 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 orphan drugs and has created thousands of jobs uh, in, in our community. But we want to make sure that we take the pictures, but maybe we don't want to put the money um, uh, where our mouths are. This amendment would restore funding to the Tiger program uh, putting much needed improvements and project across the country at risk. Uh, investing our na national infrastructure, the, the way that uh, China and Brazil and India and other countries are doing, supporting projects that make our communities more livable and sustainable. Tiger is an excellent way to do this. We should support them. I urge my colleagues to support Thank this you, amendment. DeLauro. Thank you. On the DeLauro amendment, questions on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. In the opinion of the chair, the nays have it. Uh, amendment was not approved. Sufficient hands are up. Uh, the cool, uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade. Aye. Mr. Amade, no. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. Aye. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark. Aye. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Ms. Mr. Culberson. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. DeLauro. Ms. DeLauro, aye. Mr. Dent. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Blart. Mr. diaz Blart, no. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelingheisen. Mr. Freelingheisen, no. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. Ms. Herrera Butler. Mr. Jenkins, Mr. Jenkins, no. Mr. Joyce, Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Kaptur, Ms. Kaptur, I. Mr. Kilmer, Mr. Kilmer, I. Ms. Lee, Ms. Lee, I. Mrs. Lowy, Mrs. Lowy, I. Ms. McCollum, Ms. McCollum, I. Ms. Meng, Ms. Meng, I. Mr. Molinar, Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse, Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree. Aye. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Aye. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. Aye. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney. Aye. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard, aye. Mr. Rupesberger. Mr. Rupesberger, aye. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Serrano. Aye. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Viskloski. Mr. Viskloski, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, no. Mr. Young. Mr. Young, no. Are there members who wish to record their members who wish to record their vote or change their vote? Seeing none, the clerk will tally. On this vote, the A's are 21, the nays are 30, the amendment is not agreed to. Ms. Lee, I believe, was up front. Ms. Lee, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, Lee Amendment number two. An amendment offered by Ms. Lee. Reed. Considered read, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My former, my prior amendment tried to help those who are homeless become, uh, find shelter through coordinating with the interagency council, other agencies. This amendment would keep people from falling into the ranks of the homeless. So maybe you can support this for those individuals. What it does is increase funding for the home investment program by $350 million. It would bring a total of $1.2 billion, which is the necessary level of funding to begin meeting demands from communities across the country. 
This bill funds the home program at $850 million, which is $100 million less than fiscal year 17. It would help ensure that Congress is making investments to address the affordable housing crisis that affects all of our constituents. Those individuals, if we don't address it, will again fall into the ranks of the homeless who we just decided we weren't really going to um, help. According to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, a full-time worker earning the federal minimum wage cannot afford a modest two-bedroom apartment in any state, metropolitan area, or county in the United States, whether they're Republican districts or Democratic districts. This is a fact. Now, in my district, if the average Oakland renter had to move tomorrow, they would be spending a staggering 70% of their income on housing. So it should come as no surprise that a shortage of affordable housing exists in every state in all of our districts. It's really unacceptable, and that's why fully funding the home program is so important. It's the largest federal block grant program that provides funding dedicated exclusively to increasing the availability of, of adequate affordable housing for low income and very low income families. Since budget caps were enacted in 2010, home has been cut by more than half. While funding was 1.8 billion in 2010, the bill before us has the amount at a mere $850 million. Cuts like this have translated into a 60% drop in affordable housing units that have been built or preserved through home. Sadly, this really comes at a time when almost half of the renters struggle to live as they pay more than a third of their income on housing. This would increase the funding to 1.2 billion, so I hope this committee will take note of the dire need for this kind of investment, especially at a time when our constituents are in desperately, desperate need of more affordable housing. Once again, if we don't do something, these individuals are going to fall into the ranks of the homeless, and then we'll be attempting once again to try to figure out how to help the homeless in, in this committee, which, you know, unfortunately we turned our back on tonight. Thank, thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, uh, Chairman Diaz Ballard. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, home is uh, an issue that has uh, uh, a lot of support. We've put a considerable amount of money into the bill, and I know we'll continue to revisit it. But again, this amendment would. Uh, would get us over our um, allocation, preventing the bill from getting to, to the floor. So therefore, I would join, uh, I would ask the members to join me in opposing this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Price. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the Lee Amendment and the HOME program. Um, it's uh, one of the few programs we have that actually funds new construction these days. Uh, yet the bill before us actually reduces funding for home by $100 million from last year's level. That said, it does better than President Trump wanted to do, who wanted to eliminate the program. How on earth that would have served anybody's best interest, served our needs for home ownership and employment, uh, hard to fathom. But it's, um, it's a good program. It's one of our most successful program. It's widely supported in communities across America uses multiple sources typically, brings forth uh, uh, funding from lots of partners. It's critical gap funding, home is, or seed money is another way to look at it. That brings in, in investments from nonprofits and local governments and the private sector. So it has a huge uh, multiplier effect, these home funds. Will increase uh, the number of projects we can complete each year. The demand is high. And uh, I'm talking now about rural and urban and suburban areas. Uh, home has been useful in, in all kinds of uh, housing environments. So this amendment would help make up for the sequestration cuts to this vital program. would create construction jobs in our communities. And most important, it would put safe and decent housing in reach for more of our constituents. So I urge support of the amendment. Uh, further discussion, I'll go back to Ms. Lee for a minute to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to remind you that we have a housing crisis in, in our country. And tonight, we're really not facing this head on. Uh, this budget, we're not really addressing the homeless population. We're not addressing those who are in dire need of affordable housing. 
we're really uh, eroding Americans' aspirations to achieve the American dream through home ownership. And we're not even talking about this tonight. We're talking about just basic survival. And um, it's really uh, very tragic that we don't uh, look at people uh, who have very minimal resources and, and believe that they have a right to decent and affordable housing. Finally, let me just say, in the home program, these, these funds raise another $4 for development. So it's, again, another program which leverages private dollars to help with affordable housing initiatives. And I hope we can get some bipartisan support for those who are just barely hanging on, who uh, could end up in the ranks of the homeless if we don't support this amendment. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, questions on the, on the Lee Amendment? All those in favor say aye. All those opposed to the nay? Aye. Pin in the chair, the nays have it. Sufficient number, the clerk will uh, call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar? Aye. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade? Yes. Mr. Amade, no. Mr. Bishop? Yes. Mr. Bishop, yes. Mr. Calvert? No. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter? No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright? Aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark? Aye. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cuellar? Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson. Mr. Culberson, no. Mr. Loro. Mr. Loro, aye. Mr. Dent. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Ballart. Mr. diaz Ballart, no. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelinghuisen. Mr. Freelinghuisen, no. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins, no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor, aye. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer, aye. Ms. Lee. Aye. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy. Aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCollum. Aye. Ms. McCollum, aye. Ms. Meng. Aye. Ms. Meng, aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Pa Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Aye. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. Aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. Aye. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney. Aye. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Roybal Allard. Aye. Ms. Roybal Allard, aye. Mr. Rupesberger. Mr. Rupesberger, aye. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Serrano. Aye. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Visklosky. Mr. Visklosky, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, no. Mr. Young. Mr. Young, no. Are there members who wish to record their votes or change their votes? Uh, seeing no one, the clerk will tally. On this vote, the uh, A's are, uh, are 21, the nays are 30, the amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Cartwright, I believe, was up, or uh, Ms. Captor. Thank you. are recognized, Th Mr. Thank Cartwright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the topic of uh, homelessness, my amendment provides level funding. Well, would you like the oh, clerk to, to read? I ask the clerk to read and ask The clerk is, is read and, yes, and the amendment proceed. offered. The clerk, uh, Ms. Captor will proceed. The clerk is read. Thank you. All right. This amendment concerns level funding, $40 million, for the HUD VASH vouchers so that more of our nation's veterans who face homelessness can get the urgent housing assistance they need. The chairman's current mark renews only the existing vouchers on the books. My amendment would fund uh, approximately 5,000 new vouchers for eligible veterans. Think about the districts that you represent. The HUD Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing Program combines housing rental assistance for homeless veterans with case management and clinical services provided by the Department of Veterans Affairs. Now is not the time to start cutting back on these services for our veterans, particularly as the Vietnam War generation retires and you know the rising suicide rate among that group. 
In the coming years, the HUD-VASH program will be needed more than ever. In 2016, an estimated 13,067 veterans were still without shelter on any given night. That number is appalling. Our veterans who risk their lives and limbs for us deserve better. We promise them that. Furthermore, the alarming spread of the opioid epidemic is destined to increase veteran homelessness. Recent studies show that the prevalence of homelessness among veterans suffering from opioid addiction is 10 times greater than the overall general veterans population. Therefore, the funding for more housing assistance is vital to our continued fight against this disgraceful plague among our warrior patriots. Despite the President's numerous stump speeches about improving services for veterans who he rightfully said are being absolutely mistreated, the Republican majority on the committee uh, has an opportunity here to uh, not let the HUD-VASH program wither. I urge the Republicans as well as Democrats on our committee to follow through on the President's campaign promises to help veterans and properly fund this program. Uh, don't the men and women who risk their lives for our nation's freedom deserve a proper roof over their heads and a warm bed to sleep in? With that, I strongly urge full support and a yes vote on this amendment. Thank you, Ms. Captor. Mr. diaz Ballard. Mr. Uh, Chairman, this bill does not allow the men and women who have served our country to wither. The bill provides $18.7 billion for the renewal of Section 8 vouchers, a $355 million increase. And within that amount, the bill provides that no less than $584 million shall be to renew vouch, uh, VASH vouchers. Again, this bill is committed and this, this uh, committee is committed to uh, our veterans. This funding level, by the way, uh, we know is adequate to renew leases for all veterans, all veterans currently served by HUD, uh, and expected to remain within the program. Al also, by the way, through turnover and higher leasing rates, we expect thousands of additional veterans to receive assistance. So this bill takes care of our veterans. Uh, now, the reason I cannot support this amendment, again, first, we're dealing with it, and secondly, is, is because, again, this amendment uh, would exceed would cause the bill to exceed our allocation if it was adopted. And it would prevent this good bill, which protects our veterans, to go forward to the floor. Therefore, I would ask, respectfully ask for a no vote. Okay. Th thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Price is recognized. Thank you, Mr. diaz Um Mr. Chairman, I urge the support of uh, Ms. Kaptur's amendment. Uh, we do need to be, uh, we, we need to be very clear about this, uh, however. Um, Mr. diaz Villard, in, in uh, bringing this bill together, did, uh, did fund the uh, existing, the renewal of the existing uh, vouchers. That's, uh, that's true, and he's due credit for that. The question is, though, the demand is still outstripping the supply. On any given night, you have <laughs> tens of thousands of veterans still homeless, a lot of them on the street. Uh, in 2017, we provided enough money to give uh, 5,500 additional veterans uh, vouchers, and HUD estimates that with the CAPTOR amendment, they could do that again in the, uh, in the next uh, fiscal year. So it's, a, it's an outstanding need. It's not enough just to renew the vouchers that are out there. We need to respond to the need, anticipate the need, and there's no more worthy program in the entire HUD portfolio than, uh, than this one. So um, let's honor those who've served our country. Let's make sure they have a roof over their head. Let's support Ms. Kaptur's amendment. Uh, further discussion? If not, uh, Ms. Wasserman Schultz is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in strong support of Ms. Kaptur's important amendment. And while we've seen great strides in combating veterans' homelessness, there are remain far too many veterans without housing or a place to call home. We have almost 40,000 veterans who are currently homeless, and another 1.4 million are considered at risk of homelessness due to poverty, lack of support networks, and dismal living conditions in overcrowded or substandard housing. Yet we've seen the incredible success of the HUD Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing Program and similar partnerships between these two agencies. Since 2010, more than 360,000 veterans and their families have been permanently housed rapidly rehoused or prevented from becoming homeless through such programs. Pairing housing vouchers from HUD with case management and clinical services from the VA has been instrumental. 
Instead of simply renewing vouchers for current recipients, it is our duty to continue to expand this program for other veterans facing homelessness. This amendment will provide vouchers for another 5,000 veterans that so desperately need our support. As members of Congress, our responsibilities and commitment to the 21 million veterans across this nation extend beyond passing a strong VA appropriations <laughs> bill. We must do everything we can to ensure our veterans receive the support and care they both deserve and need. And, you know, I, I know that it's a standard line for the chairman to say that, you know, this exceeds our allocation so the bill wouldn't proceed to the floor. If we pass the amendment and the leadership wants to have the bill come to the floor, it'll go to the floor. We don't really have an allocation. We haven't voted on allocations. These are made up numbers. We don't even have a budget. So essentially this is a decision that the leadership is making not to take care of these homeless veterans. Thank you, I yield back the Thank you, gentlemen, for her comments. Ms. Kaptur, to close. Yes, let me. A minute, please. I think this has been a very useful uh, discussion. And let me remind the uh, chairman of the uh, subcommittee that, yes, he has provided for the renewal of existing vouchers. However, we have over 13,000 veterans who will not be accommodated. That's a number that we can actually meet. And I have a feeling that if we really try to do this, uh, as these bills move forward, uh, looking at the allocations among various subcommittees, we can find the funds to do this well. And in addition to serving those who have been helped, serve the 13,067 veterans that were without shelter as of last year. We do need more assistance for our veterans. We've been at war for over a decade and a half. The toll is high and it's going to get higher. This bill does not meet that demand, and I believe it important enough to bring up in the form of an amendment, and I will yield back my time and ask for a vote on that, and we will bring this up again as we move to the I floor. thank the gentlewoman. The question is on the gentlewoman's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Aye. Defendant of the chair, the nays have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Sufficient hands. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade. Mr. Amaday, no. Mr. Bishop. Yes. Mr. Bishop, yes. Mr. Calvert. No. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark. Aye. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cuellar. Aye. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson. Aye. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. DeLauro. Aye. Ms. DeLauro, aye. Mr. Dent. Aye. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Bellart. No. Mr. diaz Bellart, no. Mr. Fleischman. No. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelinghuisen. No. Mr. Freelinghuisen, no. Ms. Granger. No. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves. No. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris. No. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler. No. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. Mr. Jenkins. No. Mr. Jenkins, no. Mr. Joyce. No. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor. No. Ms. Captor, I. Mr. Kilmer. I. Mr. Kilmer, I. Ms. Lee. I. Ms. Lee, I. Mrs. Lowy. I. Mrs. Lowy, I. Ms. McCollum. I. Ms. McCollum, I. Ms. Meng. Ms. Meng, aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree. Aye. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard, aye. Mr. Rupesberger. Mr. Rupesberger, aye. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Serrano. Aye. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Visklosky. Mr. Visklosky, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, no. Mr. Young. Mr. Young, no. Are there members who wish to record their vote or change their vote? Uh, seeing no one else, uh, clerk will tally. So the A's are 21, the nays are 30, the amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Uh, Ms. Lowy. I have an amendment at the desk, amendment am number two. An amendment offered by I Mrs. Lowy. It's considered read, the gentlewoman's recognized. My amendment would increase funds for lead hazard control and healthy homes 
bringing funding to 145 million and 30 million respectively. Housing is the foundation for a healthy and productive life. Without a safe base, including a home free of hazards and toxins, futures are stunted and lives are irreversibly changed. By significantly cutting lead hazard control, which identifies and removes lead-based pain hazards in homes and healthy homes, which allows lead abatement specialists to remediate an entire home of toxins, including lead, mold, and radon, this bill is putting the health and future productivity of Americans at risk. These successful programs have resulted in lower poisoning rates and better educational and behavioral outcomes for children. It is necessary for our future to fund these programs appropriately. As Flint, Michigan's lead crisis tra tragically demonstrated, the most disadvantaged neighborhoods are usually hit the hardest. Even before the crisis in Flint, children in certain neighborhoods had elevated lead levels in their blood. The Freddie Gray tragedy in Baltimore, where more than 93,000 children have been added to Maryland's lead registries over the last 20 years, has shined a light on the detrimental impacts of lead poisoning. Each dollar invested in lead pain has a control yields a return of up to $221. Adequately funding lead hazard control and healthy homes would be one of the most cost-effective ways to provide better health and education outcomes for our children, reduce the chances they will live in poverty. We have come too far. Now is not the time to make reductions. Thank you, and I know I will get support for this very important piece of legislation well, thank you, at Ms. this hour. Thank you, Ms. Lowy. Chairman diaz Ballard. Let me, uh, Mr. Chairman, first thank uh, the gentlelady. She has been a strong advocate for this issue, and I've learned a lot from her. Now, uh, we have $130 million uh, in the bill, and so uh, let, me, let me explain that. $100 million in grant for uh, older, low-income homes of uh, lead uh, Based paint hazard, an additional $25 million in healthy home grants for preventive measures to identify and correct residential health and safety hazards. Now, this account has steadily been about $110 for the last Q, a few, $110 million, not $110, $110 million. Uh, now, last year it was an anomaly. We provided a lot more uh, because of the obviously the crisis in Flint, Michigan. I'm glad we were able to to do that. So this level is already a significant increase over previous years. Repeat, it's a significant increase over previous years. I look forward to continuing to working uh, with, uh, with the ranking member who has been a staunch advocate. Uh, but at this stage, again, since it would also uh, exceed our allocation, I know you've heard that before, uh, prevent the bill from coming forward, I would uh, respectfully urge a no vote at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further discussion. Uh, Ms. DeLauro is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I rise in strong support of the Lowy Amendment, uh, returning funding to the bill for HUD's lead hazard control and healthy homes program to current levels. Lead poisoning is a crisis for children in our country. The CDC considers childhood lead poisoning the most preventable disease amongst young children. There is no healthy amount of lead for the human body. It is a known toxin that causes damage to the brain and nervous system. It stunts development, decreases bone and muscle growth, contributes to behavioral disorders, and may I add again that the CDC says that this is preventable. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, one in five cases of ADHD may be linked to lead poisoning. In my state of Connecticut, there are hundreds of thousands of homes that have lead paint and old pipes. We have some of the most, um, the oldest infrastructure uh, in the country uh, in, the, in the Northeast. Um, the housing was built before 1950 are especially at risk, which includes one third of the Connecticut housing stock. But the dangers of lead poisoning are not limited to Connecticut alone. This is a national problem. 2015, approximately 80,000 children 
across the country were identified as having elevated blood lead levels. That is just the ones that we know of. And according to CDC, at least four million homes have children living in them that are at a high cost for exposure to elevated levels of lead. This morning, I was at the New Haven Health Department where I was talking about lead poisoning, but it was in conjunction with the CDC account uh, for uh, assistance in screening and testing. That account, I might add, uh, has just $17 million in it. Um, and I was talking about increasing the funding for that effort. But the gentleman who was in charge of the grant from HUD that was dealing with the homes in New Haven has taken the, uh, 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 there's been a, a substantial decline over the years because of these HUD grants from about 25,000 children down to this year, 300 children who were identified as having lead poisoning. These grants work. They make a difference. And there is no amount of lead that a body can sustain and the damage is irreversible. We need to do more to address the problem of lead poisoning. We need to raise the awareness of exposure. We need to have testing and prevention. This amendment will allow for identifying homes with lead, address the abatement issue, and overall raise um, a, a awareness. We need to deal with the outcomes of our children's lives. We can begin by not cutting one of the few programs that are actually seeking to mitigate the presence of lead in homes. Let's try to keep our children safe. I urge the adoption of Mrs. Lowy's amendment. Thank you, Ms. Delora. Further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Price is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of, um, of Ms. Lowy's amendment. Um, uh, this is this is just another example of how uh, an inadequate allocation has led to uh, the squeezing of uh, accounts, the squeezing of programs that are that are meritorious. That I expect all of us understand are meritorious. It's uh, it's just not acceptable to cut 15 million dollars out of this program. It does. We know pretty precisely what it will uh, what it will mean. About 3,750 housing units. Uh, that have been identified as uh, containing <coughs> lead paint hazards. Most of them have already uh, caused children to be exposed to, to lead. Uh, that many units would be cut. That, in other words, we wouldn't be able to deal with them. We wouldn't be able to, uh, to remedy them. Uh, they would not be made safe for the future, for children who live there in the future. This is 100 percent preventable a problem. There, there, there's no mystery about this. So, so Ms. Lowy's made it made it very clear what uh, this amendment is about. It's um, it, it is about uh, saving lives. It's about children's health, and the dollars translate quite directly into the uh, amount of good we would be able to do. So. Um, there are groups all over this country. All of us know them. We work with them. In my case, it's the Partnership Effort for the Advancement of Children's Health in Durham, North Carolina. Other organizations working to ensure, ready to go to work, to make sure Americans' children live in healthy, lead-free homes. Please support this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Price. Ms. Capt is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I stand in support of the uh, Lowy Amendment to increase lead poisoning prevention. Uh, without question, the fund is an essential instrument for preventing lead poisoning and ensuring healthy housing. This is a national challenge. We know cities like Flint, Michigan and Jackson, Mississippi have been heavily impacted, but also places like Rochester, New York, uh, and my own hometown of Toledo, Ohio, and Cleveland, which I now represent. Flint is still reeling from lead poisoning, and it's troubling that this could still be happening in our country, but we've been told by the state of Ohio Department of Health that of the 3.7 million housing units in my own state, 42 percent of those housing units were constructed before 1950. This means that hundreds of thousands of housing units are putting our families and children at risk for lead poisoning. Annually, 150,000 children under six are being tested for lead poisoning, and thankfully, thanks to proper prevention funding, less than 
are found to have higher lead levels, so we're making progress. According to Cleveland Clinic, lead poisoning can lead to cramps, fatigue, vomiting, as well as affect children's learning and behavior. And studies also show that lowering lead levels in children's blood can actually increase IQ levels. We must protect our children and their futures. This amendment would do just that by providing sufficient funding to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program and for the Department of Housing and Urban Development's Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes. That's why I strongly support this amendment, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cap Ms. Lowy, a minute to close. with so many challenges and too often we struggle. What is the best solution? How can we address these challenges? How can we really be out in our communities helping people who need our help? This is a very simple one. An increase in lead hazard control and healthy homes would significantly improve our children's health and social outcomes while reducing future costs for taxpayers. Vote for our children. Vote for those who really need our help. Vote for this amendment. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. Thank you. Questions on the gentlewoman's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Nay. In the opinion of the chair, the nays have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Sufficient hands. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amaday. Mr. Amaday, no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop, yes. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. Deloro. Ms. Deloro, aye. Mr. Dent. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Villart. Mr. diaz Villart, no. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelingheisen. No. Mr. Freelingheisen, no. Ms. Granger. No. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins, no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor, I. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer, I. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, I. Mrs. Lowy. Mrs. Lowy, I. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum, I. Ms. Meng. Ms. Meng, I. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree. Aye. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. Aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. Aye. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard, aye. Mr. Rupesberger. Mr. Rupesberger, aye. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Serrano. Aye. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Vesklosky. Mr. Vesklosky, yes. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, yes. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, no. Mr. Young. Mr. Young, no. Are there members who wish to record their vote or change their vote? Gotten awfully quiet in here. The, the food's cut off. I think it's all gone. We're waiting for Mr. Simpson to lope down here. Mr. Simpson, how are you recorded? No? Mr. Simpson, no. Okay. Any for anyone further? The clerk will tally. Oh, uh, okay, we'll do that. Uh, on this vote, the, uh, the, the A's are 21, the nays are 30, and the amendment's not agreed to. Uh, by uh, unanimous consent, uh, could we limit our remarks to, to uh, three minutes? Would there be any objection? <laughs> Mr. Cartwright's been patient. Uh, we, well, Mr. Cartwright has been waiting like two hours to do. Mr. Cartwright from Pennsylvania, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Freelingheisen. Bring it in under three minutes if you, if you want. Thank you. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. We'll read. An amendment offered by Mr. Cartwright. 
Five minutes. Uh, Chairman Freelingheisen, it grieves me to tell you that while I had a long speech prepared, uh, I find that much of it has been obscured by blueberry stains. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> They're all gone. <laughs> My amendment is to uh, plus up the uh, CDBG account uh, by $400 million. Uh, community development block grants are very popular grants across the aisle. They've been a lifeline for renters, homeowners, and communities facing distress. Uh, CDBG grants have resulted in thriving communities across America. Uh, however, funding has dropped 50 percent since 2000 while the needs are way up. And we recognize uh, that uh, Chairman diaz Balart uh, has uh, funded this with $2.9 billion, which is exactly $2.9 billion more than the administration asked for. Uh, uh, I will not soon forget uh, seeing, uh, you know that CDBG funds in part Meals on Wheels. I won't soon forget seeing um, uh, 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 OMB Director Mulvaney uh, uh, in uh, the White House press briefing explaining that uh, uh, programs like CDBG aren't working. Uh, in fact, I quoted that to him when he appeared before our FSGG uh, subcommittee, and he denied saying that which was an interesting defense. The chairman's mark, however, is short of what we ought to do for communities in need. And I propose adding $400 million to the program. CDBG enables uh, good people all over America to, uh, to uh, reach for the American dream. Uh, I represent Scranton, Pennsylvania, where Robert and Linda live. Uh, they were about to lose their home in an unfortunate set of circumstances. CDBG grant allowed them to refinance and keep their home. It's a small investment that ensures a productive society. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cartwright, for your comments. Chairman Diaz, Diaz Ballard. I want to thank Mr. Cartwright for bringing this up. Uh, and again, this is an issue that has strong bipartisan support. We have funded it uh, at uh, $2.9 billion. And again, uh, we've had to make some choices. And so, which is why I, I'm assuming this issue we're going to continue to talk about. Um, but at this time, again, this would exceed our allocation. So therefore, I would urge a no vote, uh, understanding that this is an issue that has a lot of support and we'll continue to work with him and others. So I urge a uh, no vote at this time. Mr. Price. Mr. Chairman, I uh, urge support of Mr. Cartwright's uh, amendment. This is uh, a program we're all familiar with and we know uh, how much it means in our communities. Uh, these funds supplement, stimulate, Local investments, they create jobs, they foster economic opportunities. HUD, in fact, estimates that uh, every one million spent on CDBG supports or creates 21 jobs. This amendment would result in 8,400 new or preserved jobs. So uh, I uh, commend the gentleman for offering this amendment. We, uh, we, of course, have done better in the bill than the Trump administration proposed that we do. But it still isn't good enough, and we need to bring CDBG up to, uh, to a, ro a full and robust uh, funding level. Thank you, Mr. Price. Mr. Cartwright, a minute to close. Thank you, Chairman Freeling Highs. And despite uh, an approving economy, we have to recognize that many families and communities are continuing to struggle. CDBG provides short term support for these families. It is a government program that works for all. Uh, on both sides of the aisle, of all stripes and political persuasions. Uh, we ought to support this and, and uh, support it robustly. Yield back. Uh, uh, questions on the gentleman from Pennsylvania's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Nay. Been the chair, the nays have it, uh, and the amendment is not agreed to. Uh, sufficient hands, the clerk will call the roll. We're going Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderhold, no. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade. Aye. Mr. Amade, no. Mr. Bishop. Yes. Mr. Bishop, yes. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark. Aye. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cuellar. Aye. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson. No. Mr. Culberson, no. Mr. Loro. Aye. Mr. Loro, aye. Mr. Dent. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. Diaz Ballard. Mr. Diaz Ballard, no. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelingheisen. Mr. Freelingheisen, no. Ms. Granger. 
Miss Granger, no, Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, no, Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no, Miss Herrera Butler. Miss Herrera Butler, no. Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins, no, Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, no, Miss Captor. Miss Captor, I, Mr. Kilmer. Aye. Mr. Kilmer, I, Miss Lee. Aye. Miss Miss Lee, I, Mrs. Lowy. Aye. Mrs. Lowy, I, Miss McCullum. Miss McCullum, I, Miss Meng. Miss Meng, I, Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, no, Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no, Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no, Miss Pingree. Aye. Miss Pingree, I, Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, I, Mr. Price. Mr. Price, I, Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, I, Miss, Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby, no, Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no, Mr. Rooney. Mr. Rooney, no, Miss Royville Allard. Ms. Royville Allard, I, Mr. Rupesberger. Mr. Rupesberger, I, Mr. Ryan. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano, I, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, no, Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, no, Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, no, Mr. Vesklosky. Mr. Vesklosky, I, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, I, Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no, Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, no, Mr. Young. Mr. Young, no. Are there members who wish to record their votes or change the votes? Uh, seeing no one, are you standing, Mr. No. Just kidding, some exercise. Mr. Uh, Mr. Aguilar, are you recorded? Uh, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, sir. Okay, uh, uh, Spec, you want to do the next? We have five more amendments. Uh, the uh, clerk will tally. On this vote, the A's are 21, the nays are 30, the amendment's not ag agreed to. Mr. Uh, Mr. Price is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment that asks number two. Who will read? An amendment Mr. offered Mr. by uh, Mr. Price. Consider it read. You're re recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, this is an amendment to strike nine superfluous and problematic policy writers that have no place in this bill. Each of these writers would change existing policy without being subjected to thorough examination and debate. Now, these writers uh, needlessly add controversy to the T. HUD bill. It already suffers from a poor allocation. This just makes a bad situation worse. And these writers could serve to undermine safety and roll back uh, worker protections in a, in a serious way. Four of them involve trucking. The majority seems to regard this bill as a kind of court of appeals for trucking issues. That's not our role. We, we, we shouldn't be a court of appeals for trucking issues. But um, nonetheless, in this bill, uh, preempting state laws that provide meal and rest breaks for truckers who are subject to federal hours of service regulations, including intrastate truck drivers. A second amendment erects new barriers to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Agency's promulgation of safety fitness determination regulations. A third one raises truck weights in North Dakota. North Dakota. That's, this is in the T-HUD bill. This is what we're doing. Who, who uh, knows what that's all about? There's another amendment. It directs the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Agency to short circuit the waiver process with respect to livestock and agricultural transporters. A, a bunch of trucking issues for which we're um, kind of setting ourselves up as a court of appeals. These things, many of them were dealt with in the FAST Act debate and were rejected. And then there's more. There are a couple of um, riders which prohibit any funds for being used for high-speed rail in California. There's another rider that caps existing law to, that changes existing law to cap penalty wages paid to seafarers when ship owners or cruise lines arbitrarily deny them their pay. There's another rider that pr prohibits the Federal Housing Administration from insuring properties that have um, PACE loans, clean energy loans. There's another rider that prohibits HUD from directing a grantee to undertake a zoning law change as part of the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule. Mr. Chairman, these uh, riders have no place in this bill. We should uh, remove them, and my amendment uh, offers us a chance to, to do that all at once. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. Thank you for staying in the three minutes. I mistakenly said five, but you did it within three minutes. Mr. Diaz Ballard. I'll try to be uh, brief, Mr. Chairman. Look, we have an obligation to do uh, to listen to the other members and the folks uh, who you represent. So, whether it's ensuring that hardworking truck drivers have uniform rest break regulations, 
to saving taxpayer uh, dollars uh, from a massive rail project in a single state that, by the way, many will never, ever see. Uh, the policy provisions in this bill fulfill different obligations, and we've listened to the folks. These provisions are products of, of compromise, of hard work, of, of listening to the members of Congress, and therefore I would ask to defeat this amendment, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Ms. Lowe is recognized for thank three you, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in strong support of Mr. Price's amendment to strike the harmful riders from this bill. Now, we can disagree on dollars, millions of dollars here, millions of dollars there. Uh, we can have real disagreement about the amount of money that should be spent. But regardless of your opinions on any of these measures, this should be handled by the authorizing committees and the experts at the agencies of jurisdiction. More time for debate should be given to measures that would threaten the safety of passengers on our roadways, worker protections, homeowners' assistance, poison pill policy riders jeopardize the possibility of regular order and the future of this year's entire appropriations process. It's really outrageous, my friends, to think that Republicans would threaten another government shutdown rather than work with Democrats to enact government funding bills without poison bills. We should be enacting bills that can become law. So I urge you to vote in favor of this common sense amendment to remove the policy riders from the bill. Thank you, Ms. Lowe. Uh, Mr. Price, a minute to close. Mr. Chairman, I think this issue is quite clear. It's partly a process issue. Do we have any business uh, putting this authorizing language in, the, in, the, in this bill, particularly when we, we don't know the first thing about a number of these uh, provisions? They certainly, on the face of it, look to be uh, special interest provision removing uh, critical safety protections, uh, interfering in regulatory processes, working wor worker protections being uh, compromised. So um, it's a process issue. It's also an issue of uh, a very questionable substance. Uh, so so uh, let's, let's strip these riders out. This bill has enough challenges going forward without this kind of baggage. Thank you, Mr. Price. The question is on the Price Amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. In the opinion of the chair, the, the nays have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Sufficient hands. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade. Aye. Mr. Amade, no. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark. Aye. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cuellar. Aye. Mr. Cuellar, no. Mr. Culberson. No. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. DeLauro. Aye. Ms. DeLauro, aye. Mr. Dent. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Bellart. No. Mr. diaz Bellart, no. Mr. Fleischman. No. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelinghuisen. No. Mr. Freelinghuisen, no. Ms. Granger. No. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins, no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor, I. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer, I. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, I. Ms. Lowy. Mrs. Lowy, I. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum, I. Ms. Meng. Ms. Meng, I. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Aye. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. Aye. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney. Aye. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Roybal Allard. Aye. Ms. Roybal Allard, aye. Mr. Rupesberger. Mr. Rupesberger, aye. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Serrano. Aye. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Sw Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, no. Mr. Valadeo. No. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Visklosky. Mr. Visklosky, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder. No. Mr. Yoder, no. Mr. Young. No. Mr. Young, no. Are there members who wish to record their votes or change their votes? Mr. Graves, you're recognized. Mr. No. Graves is recorded as no. Uh, anyone else? Uh, then the clerk will tally, seeing no one else.
On this vote, the A's are 20, the nays are 31, the amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Aguilar is represented. Mr. Chairman, Dr. I have an amendment at the desk. An amendment Dr. offered Reed. by Mr. Aguilar. Uh, Considered read, you're, you're recognized, gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, this is um, uh, an issue related to positive train control. Uh, I've had an opportunity to work uh, with the chairman uh, in committee. Uh, I'd love an opportunity to continue to work with him on this issue. Um, uh, a real brief um, introduction of this item is that uh, we just want to make sure uh, that those agencies who have uh, already worked uh, to establish positive train control aren't penalized um, in future grant making opportunities. I'd love the opportunity to, to withdraw the amendment and to continue to work with the chairman to find a solution. Okay, thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Diaz Pilar. Mr. Chairman, I've worked, I've, I've, uh, I've, uh, we've, we've had uh, converse conversations on this. I appreciate his interest and I look forward to continuing to work with him. Okay, any, any further comments? Ms. Lee, uh, uh, comment. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a no, we're ready. We're still working on Aguilar's amendment. And I, I believe you have a minute to close. You don't have to use it to. S Chairman, I'll withdraw. Okay. <laughs> amendments uh, withdrawn. Uh, further amendments? Ms. Lee is recognized. Oh, uh, Ms. Oh, okay. Should we go to the gentlewoman from Maine? Is that all right? She, she provided some very good sustenance, which I have. <laughs> I, I have my hands are just full of sticky, whatever. It's delicious. Thank you very much. Ms. Pingree. <laughs> I'm sure there's still more pie out there, Mr. Chair. No, I want you to know that Mr. Ruppersberger is on a scouting expedition. So. <laughs> oh, well, speak of the devil. <laughs> what, what have you brought back for the team appropriations? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, moving right along. Ms. Pingree's recognized. It's a tough mission out there. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read. Amendment offered Close by the Ms. Reading, please. Uh, you, the gentlewoman from Maine is recognized for three minutes. Okay. Well, I can be brief at this hour because I think everybody knows about the housing vouchers, and this is an amendment to increase the housing voucher funds by $1.2 billion. Um, as most of us know, this is the largest rental assistance program in the country. It has an enormous impact on the lives of low-income families. Of the 5 million people assisted by this program, 36% are adults with children. 23% are elderly, and 20% are disabled adults. This is a program that has consistent positive outcomes in so many ways. Families that receive vouchers experience less domestic violence, for instance, and less food insecurity. If we maintain the House built the funding level, the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities estimates that 140,000 vouchers that individuals and families are currently using would not receive renewal funding next year. That number includes about 740 vouchers in my home state of Maine. We already don't have enough vouchers to go around in our state, so we cannot um, afford to reduce that number. It's unacceptable. We should not be rescinding assistance provided to families who need it most. I want to emphasize that my amendment isn't about expanding the program or providing new vouchers. It's simply about letting the families keep the vouchers they already have. I hope you'll join me in supporting this amendment, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Pinkery. Mr. Diaz-Bellard. Mr. Chairman, uh, obviously, we, uh, I appreciate her support for this program. A lot of us support this program. This bill provides $18.7 billion for voucher renewals. That's $355 million above FY17 and $1.1 billion above the request. In addition, the budget increases funding for Section 811 non-elderly disabled vouchers which will serve thousands of additional households within this especially, especially vulnerable population. So again, uh, it's an issue I know she cares about, we care about, but at this stage we cannot support the amendment because it would cause the, uh, this uh, bill to exceed our allocation. You know what that happens uh, if we do that, so therefore I would ask for a no vote at this time. Thanks, Thank gentlemen. You. Mr. Price is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I rise in, in support of uh, Ms. Trindgree's um, amendment. This is about um, the tenant-based rental assistance. Uh, again, program we're very familiar with. We know how much people depend on it in our communities. We know how long the waiting lists are and how, uh, how we struggle to, uh, to, to keep people in this housing and to uh, make it available to those who, who need it. Uh, there are some um, pretty ominous estimates, despite our efforts in this bill, to, uh, to provide for those who, uh, who have this assistance. The National Low-Income Housing Coalition and the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. They uh, estimate that about 140,000 housing vouchers that people are currently using uh, could be lost, would be lost, under the current level of funding in the bill before us. That 
that would have uh, a terrible impact on low-income families, put them at immediate risk uh, of eviction or in, even homelessness. So we, uh, we, we really have to support the people who depend on this assistance, and Ms. Pingree's amendment would allow us to do that. I urge its adoption. Thanks, the gentleman, for his comments. Ms. Pingree, a minute to close. That, uh, again, this is not to enhance the program, as you heard uh, the ranking member say, and I mentioned earlier. This is people who currently receive vouchers who will lose them. With the shortage of affordable housing in so many of our communities and states across the country, we can't afford to have this reduced funding level, and I urge my colleagues to support the amendment. The question is on the Pingree Amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. In the opinion of the chair, the nays have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Ms. Lee is recognized. Okay, thank you, Ms. Jim. This is Lee Amendment number three. An Mr. amendment Reed. offered by Mr. Ms. Lee. Consider it read. The gentlewoman's recognized for three minutes. Okay, Mr. Chairman, this amendment now, earlier I tried to address issues around the homeless, then issues around uh, low income families, trying to ensure they have access to affordable housing. Now, this one speaks to those living in public housing. And, and I just have to preface my comments by saying that, you know, we know there's a housing crisis in this country, and this Department of HUD, is their um, perspective on affordable housing is, is quite frankly shocking to me. And I, as I listen to this debate tonight, I'm reminded of Steve Bannon talking about deconstructing the administrative state. Well, basically what this does, this budget, is really deconstructing um, affordable, decent housing for every American. And, and it's really shameful. All my amendment would do is fund by $140 million to ensure that the public housing authorities can effectively administer these housing vouchers on what's left of them on a timely basis. It would bring the funding back to fiscal uh, 17 level. So I ask for, and I vote for this amendment for those living in public housing, not, a, not the homeless, not low income individuals who's, who are seeking affordable housing, now for public housing. Yes, right, thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, Chairman diaz Bullard. Mr. Chairman, thank you again. This amendment has no offsets, and so, uh, in addition to the money that we have here, we have report language that directs the Secretary to use existing authority to cut red tape and reduce administrative burdens uh, on PHS, obviously wherever possible, without compromising resident health and safety, uh, exactly, or also uh, taxpayer investments. So again, this amendment uh, is not offset, so it would do the same thing that the other ones did. It would not allow us to go to the floor, so therefore I would urge a no vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Price. Mr. Chairman, I uh, urge a, a yes vote on uh, Ms. Lee's amendment. Um, the administrative fees uh, to tenant-based rental assistance are cut in this bill from last year's level by, by $100 uh, million. That comes on top of uh, flat funding uh, the year before. You simply can't administer uh, a responsible program, an, an effective program, without uh, administrative costs being, being covered. Uh, we need to make up for the cut in the underlying bill and allow for inflation. We need to provide funding that allow for responsible administration of the program. It's quite straightforward. I urge its adoption. Uh, thank you, Mr. Price. Uh, gentle ladies recognized for, for a minute to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Once again, uh, it looks like we're trying to make sure that we can't administer what's left of these programs, which would you know, probably end up uh, allowing for the elimination of the programs because we can't, we don't have enough resources to um, effectively administer them. And and I guess I would ask the chairman, if we found an offset, would you support this in, in my closing remarks? And, and I would answer that. That's rhetorical, of course, and I'd just say I bet you would not support it, even if it had an offset. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Lee. I, I know that the chairman will always looks forward to working with you because you're bound and determined and, and you're passionate. Uh, the question is on the Lee Amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. nay. Opinion of the chair, the nays have. The amendment's not agreed to. Sufficient hands. Clerk will call. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade. No. Mr. Amade, no. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Calvert. 
Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. DeLauro. Ms. DeLauro, aye. Mr. Dent. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart, no. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelinghuisen. Mr. Freelinghuisen, no. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins, no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor, aye. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer, aye. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy. Aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCullum. Ms. McCullum, aye. Ms. Meng. Ms. Meng, aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree. Aye. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Royval Allard. Ms. Royval Allard, aye. Mr. Rupesberger. Mr. Rupesberger, aye. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson. Mr. 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 Simpson recorded no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Vesklosky. Mr. Vesklosky, aye. Ms. Wassum and Schultz. Ms. Wassum and Schultz, aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, no. Mr. Young. Mr. Young, no. Are there any members who wish to record their vote or change their vote? Uh, if not, the oh, Mr. Adderholt's recognized. How's Mr. Mr. Adderholt is not recorded. Okay. Mr. Adderholt, no. The clerk will tally then. I don't see anyone else. On this vote, the A's are 21, the nays are 30, the amendment's not agreed to. And the last amendment of the evening, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Clark from Massachusetts is, is recognized for three minutes. Please give her your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise to offer Clark Amendment 2, uh, which would provide additional funding for the tenant-based rental yeah. assistant account. An amendment offered by Ms. Clark. Wait, the or if the gentlewoman would yield, the, the other, the last amendment, uh, uh, the, we did record that vote uh, the, properly. Did I get it properly? Okay, good. Okay, excuse me. Yield back to you. Deem the waived. Thank you. Uh, the language of this flexible voucher program was originally proposed by the Department of Housing and Urban Development in their FY16 budget recommendation as a way to assist three particular groups with unique housing needs, domestic violence survivors, veterans, and families. Every day, victims of domestic violence are forced to make the impossible choice between leaving everything they know and their physical safety. While the passage of the Violence Against Women Act promised that we would do everything we can to make that choice easier, as of today, survivors of domestic violence wait when they flee the violence in their homes because they don't have the resources necessary to secure stable housing. The National Network to End Domestic Violence found that in just one 24-hour period in 2016, nearly 8,000 survivors of domestic violence were forced to make a decision between homelessness and staying with their abuser. And domestic violence victims are not alone in facing unique housing challenges. The Veterans Supportive Housing Program has demonstrated remarkable success in addressing veterans' homelessness Yet veterans who receive an other than honorable discharge can be prevented from receiving assistance under that program. Between 2011 and 2015, over 13,000 veterans received an other than honorable discharge, often because of misconduct due to traumatic brain injuries, PTSD, or other conditions 
that made them potentially ineligible for the HUD-VASH programs. And finally, this amendment would allow vouchers to be used to address homelessness and severe housing instability among families with children. The DOE and HHS estimate that 2.4 million children live in shelters, on the streets, in temporary motels, or doubled up with other families. And children can experience cognitive or mental health problems, physical ailments such as asthma, and are less likely to seed in school when they suffer from housing instability. Yet despite the magnitude of this problem, there has been no sustained federal effort to address family homelessness. I hope as we move forward, we can work on a more comprehensive solution to this problem. But in the meantime, this amendment will provide HUD with the flexibility to begin addressing this problem today. Thank you. Diaz Ballard. Mr. Chairman, I, 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 well, first, b before I address the amendment, I just want to tell Ms. Lee that I'm always looking forward to working with her, and she knows that, and so we'll continue to work with her. Uh, on this amendment, let me tell you, uh, uh, Ms. Clark has been a valuable, uh, aggressive, uh, active member of the subcommittee, and I really appreciate her bringing uh, the plight of these especially vulnerable populations to our attention. This bill maintains a strong commitment, Mr. Chairman, uh, to fighting homelessness across all populations. Look, we provide... $20.5 billion for the voucher program, $1.2 billion above the request, and $2.4 billion for homeless assistance, which is, again, $133 million above the request. Now, while, again, uh, this amendment has no, no offset, therefore I have to object to it, and I'm going to ask for a no vote, let me just tell, uh, I, I'm actually grateful that you brought this up, and I look forward to working with you on issues like this. So uh, I have to ask for no vote, uh, respectfully. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Price. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, rise to support uh, Ms. Clark's amendment. She's addressing some uh, acute issues, uh, acute problems with respect to vulnerability to uh, homelessness and, and uh, susceptibility to homelessness. And uh, these are these categories that she's, uh, she's targeted, namely veterans, uh, Native Americans, and particularly focusing here on people, uh, victims of domestic and dating violence. Uh, we know uh, particularly people experiencing domestic violence, women and children with limited economic resources uh, often. Uh, they're at increased uh, risk for homelessness. So this amendment uh, is well targeted, I think. It's uh, going to enable uh, HUD to more effectively address uh, the intersection between violence and, and homelessness and uh, further uh, meet the needs of vulnerable uh, populations. I urge the amendment's adoption. Mr. Direct, uh, any further uh, comments? Yield to uh, Ms. Clark to close. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. These are unique populations that deserve our support, and I hope my colleagues will do so through this amendment. Thank you. Questions on the Clark Amendment? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. nay. And depending on the chair, the, the nays have it, the amendment is not agreed to. Sufficient hands. Clark will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. No. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade. Mr. Amaday, no. Mr. Bishop? Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Calvert? Aye. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter? No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright? Aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Ms. Clark? Aye. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cuellar? Aye. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson? Aye. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. DeLauro? Aye. Ms. DeLauro, aye. Mr. Dent? Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Ballard. Mr. Diaz Ballard, no. Mr. Fleischman? No. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry? Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelinghuisen? No. Mr. Freelinghuisen, no. Ms. Granger? No. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves? No. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris? Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler? Ms. Herrera Butler? Mr. Jenkins? No. Mr. Jenkins, no. Mr. Joyce? No. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor? No. Ms. Captor, I. Mr. Kilmer? Mr. Kilmer, aye. Miss Lee. Aye. Miss Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy. Aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Miss McCollum. Miss McCollum, aye. Miss Meng. Miss Meng, aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo. Miss Pingree. Aye. Miss Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Aye. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. 
Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney. Mr. Rooney, no. Miss Roybal Allard. Miss Roybal Allard, I. Mr. Rupesberger. Mr. Rupesberger, I. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano, I. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Visklosky. Mr. Visklosky, I. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, I. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, no. Mr. Young. Mr. Young, no. Are there members who wish to record their vote or change their vote? Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. How about Mr. Mr. Palazzo? Palazzo? Mr. Palazzo is recorded as right no. this time, Mr. Serrano? Palazzo. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Joyce, are you up for a reason? <laughs> Mr. 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 Womack? Yes? <laughs> I know the feeling. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, excuse me. Don't leave yet. We got a vote here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, here, here, seeing no one else to record or change their vote. Oh, oh, who we got? Tally. Yeah, uh, Kirk will tally. Yep. Okay. Okay, great. On this vote, the A's are 21, the nays are 30, the amendments not agreed to. There are no, any further amendments? Seeing none, the gentleman from Kentucky is uh, recognized for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to favorably report the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2018 to the House. The question is on the gentleman's motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Aye. In the opinion of the chair. President, I ask for a roll call. Okay. Uh, the ayes have it. A roll call re requested. Yeah, all those in favor say okay. <laughs> Sufficient number. Clerk will call the uh, record the uh, record the. Mr. Adderholt, Mr. Adderholt, aye. Mr. Aguilar, Mr. Aguilar, no. Mr. Amade, Mr. Amade, yes. Mr. Bishop, Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Calvert, Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter, Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cartwright, Mr. Cartwright, no. Ms. Clark, Ms. Clark, no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Ms. Mr. Culberson. Mr. Culberson, aye. Ms. DeLauro. Ms. DeLauro, no. Mr. Dent. Mr. Dent, aye. Mr. diaz Ballard. Mr. diaz Ballard, aye. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry. M Mr. Fortenberry, aye. Mr. Freelingheisen. Aye. Mr. Freelingheisen, aye. Please give the clerk aye. your attention, please. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, aye. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler, yes. Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins, aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, aye. Ms. Captor. Ms. Ms. Captor, no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer, no. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, no. Mrs. Lowy. Mrs. Lowy, no. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum, no. Ms. Meng. Ms. Meng, no. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, yes. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, yes. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, yes. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree, no. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, no. Mr. Price. Mr. Price, no. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, no. Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mr. Rooney. Mr. Rooney, aye. Ms. Roybal Allard. Mr. Roybal Allard, no. Mr. Rupesberger. Mr. Rupesberger, no. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Serrano. Mr. S Mr. Serrano, no. Mr. Simpson. Maybe, maybe, please quiet so we can just. Mr. Simpson, I. Mr. Heard. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, I. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, I. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, I. Mr. Visklosky. Mr. Visklosky, no. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, yes. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, yes. Mr. Young. Are there any members who Young, wish, to, yes. wish to record their vote or change their vote? Seeing none, will the clerk will tally? Chairman, three days. Three days. The clerk is going to tally first. It was my error that time. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Uh, on this vote, the, the yeas are 31, the nays are 20. Uh, the bill is agreed to uh, in, in three days. Unless there's any further business, I ask unanimous Kent the staff to make, given authority to make technical and conforming changes to the, to the items approved today without objections to order. No further business. The committee's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.